Matthew here from AnyWareGaming.com and welcome to my ultimate guide to almost everything from the Tyranid Codex, Warhammer 40k 9th edition. And I say almost everything because I have played a lot of games of the Tyranids in the new edition. I actually was supposed to look up how many. I think it's been like between 10 and 15 of the, the new Tyranid Codex. I've played through all the High Fleets, many of them multiple times. I have tried out pretty much everything in this codex with the exception of mucolid spores. And so I, I feel like I have a good grasp now of the use of everything here. Now I say almost everything because I haven't done a crusade campaign at the time of the making this video, although we are about to start one. And so maybe later on I can talk about those as well and what I think about them. So this video is not meant to be, there's two things it's not meant to be. It's not meant to be a review. I'm not gonna go through and tell you what I like and don't like. And it's not meant to be a major competitive analysis. For anybody who knows me, I don't frequent tournaments. Uh, we play casually and we play with guests who come in and against each other. And while we do play competitively, meaning we try to win, we don't try to win by having always the best list. We try to win by making lists that'll be interesting and then just seeing how those games go against our opponent. And so the, the, the approach that I'm really doing here is I want to go through everything in the book. This is going to be a long video. I do plan on making shorter videos that kind of just hit on points really quickly. So if you have a hard time just sitting back and watching a two or three hour video or whatever this is going to be, then, then you can wait for those. But if you just want to be painting while listening to all the stuff you can ever hear about on Tyranids, including everything about their high fleets, their relics, their stratagems, and going through every single entry in the book that's not Forge World and talking about where I think their strengths and their weaknesses are, then this is for you. This also makes it so that the points updates that'll happen later on, because I know that they're gonna get updates, things will get nerfed points wise. Rules might change, but this is after the FAQ's already come out. But for the most part, points changes won't affect what I'm about to say here. Uh, it might just make certain things a little less effective. And that's easy because if something goes up in points, then you just know that it is now a little less effective than it used to be. If it goes down in points, then it's more effective. But I'm not really talking about this thing is too many points or too few points. I'm gonna to try to avoid that part of the conversation and just be more like, this is how I would use and how I have used this in the Tyranid Codex. So like I said, it's gonna be long-winded, so sit back and relax. And of course, I'd love to hear your comments, so leave them down in the comment section below on things that you disagree with or other ideas that you have as I talk about all of these. Because obviously a lot of this is just based on opinion, but it's also based off of playing a lot of games with them and also having played Tyranids for I think about 14 years now. So I've played it since the fourth edition Codex. So I've gone through a lot of ups and downs with this, but it is still by far my favorite faction in Warhammer 40k. I just love it. I guess also I'm not gonna be going over the lore of them. So it's not technically the guide to everything in this book. I'm not gonna go with the lore, but that's fine. So we're just gonna go through it. Basically, the order that Games Workshop puts it in the book, which doesn't always make sense, but that's okay. It just allows me to kind of flip, and we're just gonna go until I'm at the end of the book. So just hang on. This is gonna be a long, ranty video. Ranty, rambly, rambly video. Um, so let's just kind of dive right into it. So it has all the typical rules that you would expect. Uh, for example, all your troop choices gained objective secured. Uh, it does add in, so don't forget that Hive Tyrants, you can only have one Hive Tyrant per detachment. I, I like this rule. Now, once again, this is not a review. It's more like I like the lore behind it um, because there's always something weird about people bringing multiple Hive Tyrants. Now you can still do that. You bring an extra patrol detachment, throw another one in and you're fine. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's just more like lore-wise, you don't typically see multiple hive tyrants. Sometimes you will, of course, but typically you won't. Now, the really cool thing is once we jump into this, let's jump into the hive fleets. Now, the way that hive fleets work is really cool. And that is that um, just like your chapter tactics or your cults or whatever it is that you're trying to do in your army, uh, they have like, a, this is what's unique about them. These are the special rules that they get. But what's different about Tyranids that I love is that because they're adaptive, there is one of the traits that you can swap out for something else that you'd rather have. Um, and so and what that lets you do, and you don't have to decide to do this until you know who is going first. So this can be a huge advantage. First off, even forgetting the whole deciding who goes first, that's when you can do it. It gives you a lot more variety. So basically, um, after the high fleets, we have what are called biomorphologies, and they call it infinite biomorphologies. So there's the hunt, lurk and feed biomorphologies. 
And so hunt obviously is more about like being hyper aggressive, lurk is about being protective, and then feed is somewhere in between that. Um, or maybe feed is hyper aggressive. Hunt and feed, you know, there's a slight differences between those nuanced words right there. But each one of these have five abilities. So it's kind of like make your own. Pretty much every book has a make your own chapter or make your own cult or make your own uh, sub faction, whatever it is. And so you can do this with this. You choose one from one biomorphology and one for another. So one hunt and one lurk or one lurk and one feed. But here's the really cool thing that every high fleet can swap out one of its adaptive trait for something from two of those. So I'm just going to go into it. It'll make more sense if you're not familiar with it. And of course, if you are familiar with it, then you're already wanting me to get past this anyways. So let's start with High Fleet Behemoth. So their High Fleet adaptation is called Hyper Aggression. And essentially is uh, when you charge, our charge, or heroic intervene, you get plus one strength. Their adaptive trait is you get to reroll charges. Now that adaptive trait is very powerful. And the first time I played High Fleet Behemoth, I was like, I'm not switching that one out. Reroll charges is huge. But they can swap out that adaptive one. So they can't swap out the one that gives them plus one strength. That one's like, that's hyper aggression. Behemoth are always that. The adaptive one is reroll charges. So they can swap it out for a hunt or lurk. And so that's, you, won't, you won't get access to all three. And so between hunt and lurk, we've got 10 choices. Uh, and I'll come to those at the end and we'll go over all of them. But for example, I could choose augmented ferocity and get plus one to my charges instead. Now it's arguable which one's better. I think reroll is better, so I wouldn't choose that one. But like for example, you could do territorial instincts under lurk, which monsters gain objective secured. And on top of that, if they have 10 or more wounds, they count as five models. Now I play a lot of Tempest of War, but I know this applies to GT as well, that when something's objective secured, often in Tempest of War, there's a lot of actions that say infantry models or objective secured models can do this. So if you have a lot of monsters, not only are they objective secured, so they can grab objectives a lot easier, but um, they can perform actions which normally would not be available to them or normally would take longer to complete. And I think that's a big deal. And so all of a sudden you have these choices. So it's not so much, I'm not going to try to tell you Behemoth needs to choose that one because it depends if you have a lot of monsters or not. Um, but it gives you those choices of when you build your army, you can customize and you can still use Behemoth. So it's not like, oh, I like Behemoth, except I'd rather have that one trait. It's like, great, now do that. Because you still get access to the Warlord trait, Psychic Power, Relic, and the Stratagem, of course, from Behemoth. So I like Behemoth a lot when it comes to, obviously, close combat armies. It, 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 it shines there. But it, it has a couple little things. As you look through the book, there's a, a couple places that really shines. Carnifexes, it shines with really well. Because Carnifexes are, are base strength six. And six is okay. And you give a, a Carnifex adrenal glands and it becomes strength seven. But six and seven, there's not usually much of a difference between those two. Not a lot of things out there are, against vehicles, it'll make a difference usually. It'll go, probably go from wounding on fives to wounding on fours. Or against some vehicles from fours to threes. But the sweet spot for strength, of course, is strength eight. Because then all of a sudden you're doubling out toughness four and you're wounding on twos. And so I really like it for the Carnifexes with adrenal glands. So Screamer Killers or just regular Carnifexes for that matter. Because it gets them all the way up to strength eight. So all of a sudden things that are toughness four, you are wounding on twos against. And that, that, that versatility is really good. It's less useful on Tyranid Warriors who you can, you can already get to strength eight with a combination of bone swords and adrenal glands because they start at uh, strength five. So going from strength eight to strength nine, unless you're playing against like Imperial Knights or, or Lehman Russes or something, warriors won't get much benefit out of Behemoth, um, at least in, that, in the hyper aggression. We'll, we'll talk about the other stuff, of course. Um, like warriors will definitely get um, use out of unparalleled ferocity, which is their stratagem, which we'll come to. Uh, and, and there's some other like outliers as well. I'm going to just quickly flip so that I don't give you the wrong information here. Like a Broodlord, for example, if you're bringing them, they're strength five normally. So on the charge, they'll be strength six. Or when they're charged, they'll be strength six. This is, once again, less of a big deal because five to six is nice in some cases. But the Broodlord already has a built-in reroll to wound. So not as big a deal. Um, the, and the Hive Tyrant, for example, is strength seven. But you're either going to be equipping with bone swords, which will make them strength 10, or you're most likely given adrenal glands as well, which is pretty much like something that you always want to do, which will bring them to strength 8 as well. So Behemoth seems to really shine, uh, at least when you're coming to the strength aspect of it, on, um, on Carnifexes. That's, that's where I see the biggest boon there. And I love Carnifexes, by the way, and I'm, I'm kind of skipping ahead here, but Carnifexes are definitely... The all, all they're they're awesome now, and it's taken a long time for them to come back to that. There was a I can't remember what edition it was because they're all muddled together in my head, where you had what was called Nidzilla, 
And that was back in the day when if you brought, if you could bring seven monstrous creatures, that was like overpowered. And it was basically a hive tyrant and then six carnifexes. Uh, because back then a carnifex, if he was under a certain points, was an elite choice. And if he was over that, he was a heavy support. Or you could choose to make him a heavy support. Or you could choose to make him an elite choice. So you could actually bring six though, because back then you were restricted to three elites and three heavy support. And they didn't come in broods of three. And there was no other detachments and stuff. It was just that, uh, the, the combined arms attachment. So that was scary, but ever since then the Carnifex has not been scary. They've just been outpaced by other monsters that the, the, the Tyranids came out with, or just other armies. Well, I can say now that with their minus one damage and all this other stuff, that they are terrifying again. In fact, they're definitely upper tier in the Codex. And so Behemoth just takes them to the next level, which I love. Now, there are still some other uses for Behemoth, though, especially because you can swap out that reroll charge for something else. Um, for example... Uh, the Psychic Power Unstoppable Onslaught is ridiculously powerful for anything that is close combat because it is just a plus one to wound in melee. So I want you to picture, for example, Hormigants, who are okay. They're, they're, they're not like the, the best thing in this codex, but they are definitely really good. So you have a Hormigant, which is strength three. You give them, let's say you don't even pay for the adrenal glands. Now on the charge, the Hormigant becomes strength four. So that's actually, I should have mentioned that as another winner in the behemoth, because then you don't have to pay those two points per model to give them adrenal glands, although it might still be worth it, to be honest, because even though they go from eight to 10 points, that extra movement, that inch of movement, access to the stratagem that lets you get more attacks, we'll get to that in a second or later on, and all of that might be still be worth it. But you don't even have to give it to them because they're strength four on the charge, and then if you put Unstoppable Onslaught, they get plus one to their wound roll. So there's basically, even if they're up against a toughness eight thing, they're still wounding it on fives, but most likely they're going to be wounding on fours or threes, which is pretty crazy if you think about it. Like charging space marines and are wounding them on threes. Uh, now mind you, the minus one AP on their, their weapon is not as important against space marines because of armor contempt, ignoring one level of AP. But still, with just three attacks each, wounding on threes is pretty, pretty awesome. Um, so I find that that plus one to wound is going to work the best on your griblies, on your little guys, right? That only works in melee though. So Behemoth, you're definitely choosing Behemoth if you've built uh, a mainly close combat Tyranid army. Um, the, the Warlord trait is cool, except that it just gets shadowed by other Warlord traits. Uh, Monstrous Hunger, that if you roll six to wound, you do a mortal wound in addition to your normal damage. It's fun. But uh, the Tyranid Codex suffers from having too many good Warlord traits. And I'm not going to complain about that because it means I can kind of swap them out and do different combos and have fun. Because I like that. I like to, and the internal balance of a book. This is probably the most internally balanced Tyranid book that I've ever played. That I can almost play anything from it and it works. And that also might be just because a little thing, at this point everything is a little too good. And so that means even the stuff that's bad. So maybe, they, maybe it's not quite accurate to say there's good internal balance. It's more just like everything's so good. Uh, the, the Relic is okay, it's plus one damage, so that can be a big deal if you throw it on a brood lord or heck, on anything, plus one damage can be a big deal. It's, that's more like depending on what you're fighting. Um, like a brood lord, for example, I believe he's only damage two. And damage two in the current meta is not great, because a lot of things are minus one damage. And so upping that to damage three, or heck, you can put it on a Trigon Prime, which arguably is not that great because it has, a, has 12 damage two attacks. Um, and, and that's, that's okay, except that a lot of things are minus one damage and all of a sudden it becomes like piddly. But you make them damage three attacks, then against armies that don't have minus one damage, that's massive. And against, like that's killing terminators or vehicles quite quickly. And against armies that do have minus one damage, you're still doing two damage at least. So that, that relic is pretty good, but that's more depending on what you are playing against. So Behemoth, definitely awfully, obviously a tool for close combat. High Fleet Kraken obviously is another close combat one. Um, I like Kraken because it's more about mobility than it is about brute strength, but also because its main adaptation is questing tendrils, which is instead of plus one strength like Behemoth on the charge or one charge or heroically intervening. Um, oh, sorry, this one is only on the charge. On the charge, it gets an extra AP, so the armor penetration of its weapons is improved by one. So those Hormigants charging in with adrenal glands are going to be strength four minus two AP on the charge. So it's only on the charge, so it's not when charge or heroically intervening. Uh, that is different. It's interesting that they don't include heroically intervening, though. That you have to watch out for those little differences. Like Carnifexes, for example, get an extra attack when they charge or heroically intervene. Which you're wondering, well, the Carnifex can't heroically intervene, but there is a biomorphology that lets your whole army heroically intervene. 
but they don't get it when they're charged. But if you're playing Behemoth, if they're charged, they're still going to get the plus one strength, because Behemoth is when charged. But if they're playing Kraken, they'll only get the extra AP on the charge, so pay attention, close attention to those kind of details. Now the adaptive one here would be a hard one to choose to, to get rid of. Uh, basically when it advances, if you're not using any special stratagems to help that advance, then instead of advancing D6, it advances D3 plus 3. So your whole army gets that. So that's a minimum 4 inch advance. So instead of a 1 to 6 inch advance, you're going to 4 to 6 inch advance. That's a, that's a huge difference. Um, especially if you bring the Psychic Power Onslaught, which you can throw on a unit, and one of the things Onslaught does is allows you to advance and still charge, which is pretty big. Now the Hyper Adaptations has access to our Feed and Hunt, and so there's still going to be some, some desire to maybe swap it out. Like for example, under Feed, there is one that says, a Wreath in the Shadow, that your enemy cannot overwatch or set to defend. So imagine just blanket saying, you are not allowed to overwatch me. So if you're looking at somebody with a lot of flamers before the game starts, and the nice thing is you don't have to choose this until you see your opponent's army and even know who's going first. So you can be like, I really like that extra D3 plus 3 inches, but you've got a lot of flamers, and I want to get in combat with you because I'm playing Kraken, which is obviously another close combat one. And so I'm going to turn off your Overwatch. And heck, I even turn off Set to Defend, which I don't see used very often. And so if you're not familiar with what Set to Defend is, it's essentially if you're behind some sort of defensible position, like a, defen a defense line, when you're charged, if you overwatch, you get to hit on fives, and, or you can set to defend, which is you get plus one to hit in close combat. And so essentially, the, um, the, 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 you say, say no to that. You just can't, you can't do either of those, which is pretty cool. And so, so yeah, so once again, adapt, the adaptive trait is really good, but it, it's adaptive. So you can see your opponent and be like, I'm going to switch to this, which is, I think is very lore friendly for the Tyranids. Uh, their Warlord trait, once again, suffers like the Behemoth one of being good, but there's lots of other good ones, which is just whenever your opponent uses a stratagem on a 5+, plus, you get a command point. That's cool, but you're going to want some... It depends. It really depends what your characters are. Like, for example, if you don't have a Hive Tyrant, you don't have a Trigon Prime, maybe your characters are a Neurothrope and, like, a Tyranid Prime or something. In that case, yeah, sure. You know, we're not really too concerned about some of the other Warlord traits, although even then, they're still really good ones. So I'm even saying that. The Neurothrope will want the Synaptic Tendrils one, which lets him do his psychic thing on two things. Or the Prime will want that. Or the Prime will want some close combat ones. So it'll be hard to ever choose this one. The uh, Synaptic Lure Psychic Power for Kraken is pretty cool. Um, you basically choose an enemy within 18 inches or Synaptic Link range, and everybody can reroll charges against that enemy. So you combine that with some of the stratagems, because it's a stratagem that a Synapse creature, if it hits something with shooting, you can spend a command point, and everybody gets three dice to charge that. Take your best two. You combine that with a re this reroll, and you can guarantee some charges in there. Combine that with lictors getting close and giving plus two to charge, which we'll come to. If I'm jumping all over the place, don't worry. I'll, I'm going to be very thorough as I go through this, but I'm not going to not talk about things further forward because it, it's going it, to. It all kind of inter, it, it webs together, obviously. The their mutation, the relic, is chameleonic mutation. It's like the old Kraken one, except it's modified for what this book is like. It's minus one to hit them, and you can't reroll that hit. That's a good relic, but it's there's so many good relics. So I like it. I like the fact that it's good too. Um, if I was if I was to rank it, there's there's going to be better relics for close combat, um, but it's still really good. And then their stratagem is really neat. It's opportunistic opportunistic advance. Um, when you grab a, a kraken unit to move, when they advance, they advance eight inches instead. And they don't suffer penalties for firing assault weapons when they advance. So all of a sudden, this could actually be used in conjunction with your termagants, because they normally move six, and you now move them 14 inches, and they can still fire their flesh bores, which are super overpowered, by the way. So Kraken, while it obviously does have the adaptations to be good for close combat, this opportunistic advance, uh, well, it'll combine obviously with the onslaught psychic power, which lets you advance and charge. But I see it more like a, you can still have some good supporting firepower, like a, a big chunky unit of 30 termagants with a turvagon right behind it. So the turvagon could pop its snap to comparative, give everybody plus two movement, and then all of a sudden those, um, those termagants could move 16 inches and fire without any penalty, after having been buffed by the turvagon, of course, to be hitting on threes. And so just that, that's, that's terrifying. That's actually incredibly terrifying. It's 16 inch movement. Even without that extra from the, the Turbogon, it's still 14 inches of movement. 
Uh, or you can get hormigants with adrenal glands to move 19 inches with that. Throw the psychic power of Onslaught on them and they can still charge. Now, arguably that's not going to be much better than just using the stratagem that's built specifically for them that lets them advance 6 inches automatically and still charge, but it gives you options, which I like. Let's go to everybody's favorite High Fleet, High Fleet Leviathan. Obviously this one's created the biggest stir in the community because of its synaptic control adaptation, which is just that all your synapse creatures have transhuman on them. If you're not familiar with transhuman, it basically means you can't wound me on a one, two, or three. I can be a toughness three guy. There aren't any toughness three synapse, but, uh, and you could be hit me with a strength 50,000 weapon and you still can only wound me on fours because reasons. Because my synaptic network is so strong that even the mangled remains of mortally wounded beasts can be compelled to fight on. That's actually kind of cool. Now that I, that's the first time I read that. That's actually kind of cool. So on top of that, any other creatures within synapse range have a mini transhuman, which they cannot be wounded on twos. Now I've played Leviathan a couple times, and uh, that didn't come up very often. Uh, in fact, all the games that I've played, it was very rare that my opponent was wounding me on twos. Because basically that's only when you're firing at like termagants or hormigants or gargoyles and you have strength six or higher weapons. But typically your strength six or higher weapons don't want to fire at the small guys. That's typical. But there are there are weapons, of course, like assault cannons and stuff like that, which are going to which are going to be great against them. And so that part doesn't really matter, but the fact that your synapse creatures are transhuman all the time, so your warriors, Tyranid warriors, which are toughness five, can never be wounded on better than fours. Uh, there's a lot of things that'll wound them on threes normally, so fours is a big deal. Your your zone throats can't be wounded on better than fours. It's not as big a deal on your big stuff, like your current effect, or sorry, like your hive tyrants and stuff, because their toughness is a little higher, so you're less likely wounding them on better than fours. But it, it's it, it essentially if you really want to be powerful with high fleet leviathan, I say that you you lean into tyranid warriors, and then of course neurothropes and zone throats. But that's getting a little too good, at least at the current time of me making this video. That's not very nice. Um, a lot of people don't like Leviathan playing against Leviathan because of the, the synaptic control thing. I say it's a shame because I actually think that Leviathan's cool for one other reason, which is its psychic power, which is Hive Nexus. So we haven't got to synaptic imperatives yet, but essentially every type of synapse creature has a unique type of synaptic imperative. And you can activate one of these at the beginning of a battle round, and it applies to all your, your anybody within synapse range. So for example, the zone thropes have a Everybody and their synapse has a 5-up invuln, unless they're a monster, in which case they have a 4-up invuln. And so the cool thing about a, this uh, Hive Nexus psychic power is that you can actually use a, a psychic power to give a specific single unit the synaptic imperative from a synapse creature that's on the table. Because you can only use that synaptic imperative once per, per game in the battle round, but if you keep using that psychic power, you can give it to them. For example, you really want you really want that monster to always have a 4-up invuln, and so you, you just cast Hive Nexus on them and you, use, you have your zone throws on the table and you use their synaptic imperative on them. That's actually a bad example. The better ones are like the Maliceptors, which lets you fall back, advance, and still do actions. Lets you do psychic powers and still do psychic actions. And so you put that on the Maliceptor and then he becomes a beat stick of being able to just... Uh, although that's, that's different now with the FAQ changing that, but still, it's, it's really good for being able to advance and do... Um, do objectives, or because you want the Maliceptor to turn on his minus one strength bubble, which is a psychic action, and still cast one or two more psychic powers if you want the extra one, of course, with the, with the stratagem. The adaptive trait for Leviathan is not that great, which means you can swap it out for something that's cooler. It's just that you get to reroll one hit roll whenever you shoot or fight. That's cool for like your big guns if you have like a rupture cannon on a Tyrant effects, um, or like the special relic heavy venom cannon on a Hive Tyrant. That's pretty neat because then you're hitting on twos, you get to reroll out one miss, and most likely there's not going to be more than one miss. Um, but it's, it's easy to swap that one out for a feed or a hunt biomorphology, which there is plenty of, which I said we'll get to. The Warlord trait is interesting, but once again, it's outshone by the just the basic vanilla war tra Warlord traits, and it's once per battle round. The Warlord can reroll a hit roll, a wound roll, a damage roll, an advance roll, a charge roll, a psychic test, or a saving throw. Obviously some of those are bigger winners than others, like psychic test, or saving throw, um, and then situationally on uh, charge roll as well. That's all cool, but if you're a Hive Tyrant, most likely you want the Warlord Trait Adaptive um, Biology, which gives you a 5-up ignoring wounds, or you're going to want the Synaptic Tendril, so you can hand out whatever buff you do in the command phase to two units instead of one. Or, heck, Alien Cunning is a great one, because it makes you objective-secured, 
and you can do actions even if you fall back or advance. And you count as five models, I believe, if I can get all that right. We'll get to those. Those are just they're so awesome. It's hard to decide, yeah, I'd rather reroll one thing per battle round. The bio artifact relic, the perceptive node. This one's interesting. I'll admit I haven't really used it yet. And so uh, I can see the use, but it's a, it's a very situational thing. So basically when it's, it's like an aspect scanner, which allows you to attack things that come in from reinforcements or your opponent. So when your opponent brings in reinforcements, each time an enemy unit is set up as reinforcements within 18 inches of the character with this relic, they can choose a core or character, so that could be that hive timer with that relic gun, within six inches of the bear, and they can fire at that unit that showed up from reinforcements. Um, and there's no limit to the number of times that you can do that. The only limit is that each unit can only fire once. So if you have the person with this relic surrounded by three units that can fire that are core or characters, then you can each of them can do it one other, like at a different time. Um, they can shoot. Yeah, you, 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 each time it's only once per reinforcement. So a reinforcement comes in, you can have one unit fire at it, but you can't just be like trigger all those units. And then another reinforcement shows up, and it's 18 inches of uh, of that character. So that's a. I haven't. I, once again, I kind of steer away from Leviathan because um, people kind of get annoyed by it because of the transhuman all the synapse. But that's cool. I, w I would actually want to try that relic pretty badly. I would consider, like you can't put it on the Hive Tyrant, obviously. You maybe have a Neurothrope or some other secondary character that you're, you're less concerned about them getting a really, really good relic. And you give them the Preceptive Node, like a Neurothrope, and he can sit next to a Hive Tyrant with the Relic venom, Heavy Venom Cannon. And then maybe a unit of Termagants and a unit of Warriors uh, with their Death Spitters and Venom Cannons and Barb Stranglers. And then essentially say, yeah, come in. If you know your opponent has uh, a lot of reinforcements, and the only problem here is like you're choosing your relic before you see your opponent's army, so you don't know if they're going to do reinforcements at all. So that's why it's definitely not like the better one of the better relics, but it's still really cool. The combined assault stratagem is really neat too. If you have two units fighting the same um, enemy unit, then they can get plus one to their AP. So they're basically fine. The, they're they're fighting the, the the chinks in the armor. Kings in the armor, whatever it is. Uh, the broods of the High Fleet Leviathan hunt as one, exhibiting eerie precision in their strikes. Um, so, so yeah, so that, that's pretty cool too. So two units have to be fighting the same thing. So basically, you select the, the enemy unit. That's within two or more Leviathan units in engagement range. And then every time anybody attacks that unit, you get plus one AP. That's pretty cool. So High Fleet Leviathan is going to be like your one of your top picks for playing a little harder. Uh, mainly because it's very survivable and it has some pretty good tools in it. High Fleet Gorgon, uh, definitely the big loser in my opinion. Um, you can leave comments below if you disagree. I just can't seem to find a really good use for High Fleet Gorgon. And uh, you'll see why as I talk about it. Um, but that means it's a great High Fleet to bring if you're playing something that's really having a hard time and you don't want to beat them too badly. So you want to play down, High Fleet Gorgon is the way to go. So essentially their adaptation is adaptive, to adaptive toxins, which sounds great, right? Essentially, every time they attack, shooting or close combat, wound rolls of 4 plus always succeed, regardless of the enemy toughness. Sounds pretty cool, right? It excludes vehicles and titanics. So let's really think about the weapons that the Tyranids are using. For the most part, their strength five, for shooting, their strength 5 or higher. And so you're most likely wounding on 4 or better anyways, unless it's a vehicle or it's some sort of monster. So High Fleet Gorgon is really good against other Tyranids. That's about it. Now, because there's not a lot of other armies that mass their monsters or have a lot of Toughness 6 not monsters. Uh, there are, of course, exceptions to that, but uh, that's just list tailoring galore. If you're like, hey, you've got a lot of monsters, all right, finally I can play High Fleet Gorgon. But heck, that's okay, I guess. So I don't really see that, that adaptive toxin thing is just, I, I've played High Fleet Gorgon a couple times, and not once did that come up. Um, now maybe I could try to skew it. So maybe Termagants with Devourers instead, which I've never seen a use for Devourers because they're just not as good as Flesh Boars. But there are a lot of shots at Strength 4. So all of a sudden it's like I always win you on 4s, so those Toughness 5 Death Guard things maybe. But like so what? Its adaptive trait is kind of boring too. Whenever you shoot or fight, you can reroll one Wound Roll. So it's like Leviathan except for Wound Rolls instead of Hit Rolls. So this one I'm just like, I, I don't see the point of it at all. 
Um, the Warlord trait's cool, but once again, other Warlord traits are better. That basically, at the start of the fight phase, the, the Warlord hits everything within three inches, that's enemies. On a two plus, they take a mortal wound. On a six, they take D3. So basically, they're stinky. Lethal miasma. And uh, the, the, now there are some uses here for the psychic power and the stratagem. The psychic power is poisonous influence. Um, you basically put it on a Gorgon unit, and whenever they do a six to wound, they do a mortal wound in addition. So that's cool. So all of a sudden, your big unit of Hormigants can be super scary. And then the stratagem is that it only works on units with Toxin Sacks. So normally Toxin Sacks work that when you roll to hit in close combat, if you roll a 6 to hit, you auto-wound. It doesn't matter if it's a vehicle or a Titanic or anything. It's just all these wounds. Um, you can activate the Hypertoxicity Gorgon stratagem on something that has Toxin Sacks, and it then will, on 5s, it'll wound. So it's not that you can't be good with Gorgon, but it's more like it's still good because Tyranids are really good, and not because it's really bringing much to it. So it's adaptive toxins, totally useless. You'll swap out that adaptive for something more useful under feed or lurk. And then make sure you put some toxin sacks on maybe Hormigants or Tyranid Warriors. And now whenever they roll fives to hit, they automatically wound. And you can give them the sixes to wound, uh, do mortal wound psychic power. Obviously you don't want to combine those two because if you roll five to hit, then you don't roll to wound if you're trying to fish for mortal wounds. Depends what you're fighting against. If you're fighting against something with mediocre saves, then who cares about getting mortal wounds? But if you're fighting against something with um, decent saves, then getting those mortal wounds is a big deal. The bio artifact relic, hypermorphology, hypermorphic biology, gives uh, plus one toughness to the bear, and they count as having twice as many wounds left. So obviously more geared towards like Hive Tyrants or Trigon Primes, which actually bracket. Um, and that's cool, a Hive Tyrant with toughness nine, that's scary. But you know, scarier is that relic gun that fires and does a lot more damage. Or a relic close combat weapon that does a lot more damage. That sounds better to me. But yeah. So Gorgon, to me, bottom of the list. I'm not even sure who I'd put exactly at the top of the list. I think a lot of the community would put Leviathan. But me personally, I find that uh, I really enjoy Kronos and Behemoth. Uh, and even Yormonger, which we'll talk about now. High Fleet Yormonger. Their adaptation is Tunnel Networks. So if you fire anything that's more than 12 inches away, they count as being in dense cover, which is minus one to hit, unless you ignore cover, of course. If they're a monster, they have to be more than 18 inches away. That in and of itself is pretty cool if you're not playing with a lot of monsters. Um, but as you'll see, I like Yormonger for some of the other combos you can do. Its adaptive trait seems pretty useless, like really useless. Uh, when, they, when you get targeted by a blast weapon, um, you count as half the number of models rounded up for if they, how many attacks they get. So if you brought nine Tyranid Warriors, typically a blast weapon will get minimum three because there's at least six models in that. But they would count as five Tyranid Warriors, so they no longer get their minimum three. Uh, it doesn't really work for huge swarms. Like, I guess if you had 20 Hormigants or Termigants, then all of a sudden they don't get their max shots because they count as having 10 instead. So Yormonger is kind of getting the sense that they want to be lots of models. But honestly, it just feels like that's only against blast weapons. I'd much rather swap that out for a hunt or a lurk biomorphology. For example, let's say I did bring lots of Hormigants and Termigants and Gargoyles, which would benefit from that blasting. I could swap it out for Synaptic Goading. At the start of the first battle round, before the first turn begins, Endless Multitude Units, which is your Termigants, Hormigants, and Gargoyles, just move six inches. Yeah, as long as they started in your deployment zone which I can't think of any reasons right now where they couldn't or they wouldn't. So this move six inches. So if you know you roll and you oh, I'm going first. I'm going to swap out to synaptic goading. They move six inches forward. Boom, they're right in your face. That's pretty cool. Or grabbing objectives or whatever else. That's just one example. There's other good ones as well. So yeah, so the, the tunnel network's an adaptive trait. I'm not, that's not why I like your monger. Um, why I like your monger is actually their strategy buried in weight. Buried in weight. That's a weird name that I think about it. They're, they're buried to wait, buried in wait, because they're not buried like in the wait, they're buried and they're waiting. So essentially, you can put a unit in deep strike reserve, so they can pop up anywhere on the table more than nine inches away. Um, and you can use the stratagem twice if in a 2,000 point game, three times in a 3,000 point game, and once in a 1,000 point game, essentially. Um, and so you have to remember though that like what I like this for is screamer killers because a screamer killer you buy them in a unit of three after they're deployed they act individually but not until they're deployed so that unit of three for one command point is underground ready to pop up 
which is pretty darn scary. You combine it with things like Electric given plus two charge, or the Synaptic Lure from a Synapse creature giving them uh, roll three dice on the charge against a certain unit. And that is scary, like super scary. It has lots of other uses as well, just lots of other units that could go underground and that would be good for. Um, the Warlord trait, uh, it's, it's fine, but once again, not that great. It just basically, in the command phase, you select a unit and they ignore cover. That's, that's okay, um, depending on the situation. The Psychic Power Lurking Maws is really cool. It just gives a unit plus one AP in close combat. You see a lot of the stuff here in his focus is on close combat, which I enjoy. Um, and then the Bio Artifact Relic, Bio Artifact Relic, the Infrasonic Roar. I don't think I'll ever really use this one. It's just, it's just at the end of the movement phase, you choose an enemy within 12 inches, roll 3d6. If it's equal to or higher than their leadership, then they can't perform actions. And if they're currently performing an action, it fails. Now that's going to be pretty situational, which is why I don't think it would be fun to run it, because it's like I want, I'm trying to find a place where I can use this. And it's like, ah, oh, it's not going to use it. I'd rather have just brought one of the other cooler relics. And that's the way I see that one. So Yormonger, really cool. Almost done. we got two more, then we'll talk about the biomorphologies. High Fleet Kronos. Uh, High Fleet Kronos is your shooting slash kind of psych anti-psychic one. Uh, which I like, and um, and so if you're doing a, a, a like a shooting list, like lots of termagants, Karn effects is with uh, it's less important for the long range shooting, but you'll you'll see what I mean. Their high fleet adaptation is bio barrage. All ranged weapons get plus four inches to their range. That's a big deal. You put that on uh, pyrovores, for example. Their flamers normally twelve inches. Now it's sixteen. The um, like termagants with their flesh bores are now ranged twenty two inches with that strength five minus one shot. It's scary, but here's the more scary part. It's the adaptive one, which I would almost never swap out unless I'm desperate. Any enemies within half range of a weapon, you get an extra AP against. So that's combining with that plus four. So those termagants are gonna move forward. If they get within 11 inches of you, their weapons are strength five minus two. That is scary. But it's also just scary because armor of contempt is such a big thing, ignoring one level of AP. Any way that you can get extra a armor penetration in, in 40k right now is a big deal because so many players play Space Marines and Chaos Space Marines, and then even Sisters of Battle are affected by that as well. So that extra AP is big. And if they don't have armor of contempt, well, the extra AP is also great because that extra minus one can and almost ensure smaller things die and even medium things are going to have a hard time against. Like you can take down decent vehicles with one barrage from Termagants with a plus one to hit from a Turbagon and the, and the Kraken stuff. So that's pretty cool. Most of the rest of the stuff in Kronos focuses on being kind of anti-Psyker, which is the lore behind High Fleet Kronos. I know I wasn't going to talk about lore, but I'll give you a quick one. High Fleet Kronos was developed as a response, as far as we know, to chaos. So Tyranids don't really like fighting chaos because there's no food to eat afterwards, except like their followers. But you kill a demon, there's nothing to eat. And demons don't actually like killing Tyranids either because there's no blood, there's no souls to, to reap, all that kind of stuff. So they don't like each other. But they, it's more like two predators competing over the same food source. And so High Fleet Kronos was developed to go after, like they'll dive right in and they actually create a stronger shadow in the warp and they nullify the warp more in their area. Almost like what the Necrons are trying to do, except the, the Tyranids don't destroy the warp uh, and quell it. It's more like they just push chaos out of it. Um, the chaos gods out of it, I should say. And so they're supposed to be basically the anti psyker one. So the Warlord trait, for example, Soul Hunger, um, is on, on, basically it's an 18-inch or, aura that your enemy psychers will peril on any double. And remember, Shadow in the Warp, I say remember, we haven't gotten there yet, Shadow in the Warp gives you minus one to your psychic test to your enemies, but it also, whenever they peril, they take an extra mortal wound. So that's extra scary. That, that's actually a Warlord trait. If I was playing Kronos, um, it's still situational because you need to know that your opponent's going to be bringing in psychers. But if they do, that 18, that's a big 18-inch ore that you can get off the field, uh, put it on a narrow throat, something that you're not as worried about having a really good uh, Warlord trade on, and get up the field and have that aura of like, you don't want to roll your psychic test. Because uh, in case you don't know the math, like rolling a double on 2d6 is a 1 in 6 chance. I don't know about you, that's pretty scary. That's like rolling a 1 on a single die. I, I, and you're going to take d3 plus 1 mortal wounds, uh, which is pretty scary. Now it doesn't make this the psychic test not not pass, because like perils doesn't say the psychic test auto fails. Obviously double one perils does, but um, but if they die, the power doesn't go off. And at the very least, they're hurt. Uh, the psychic power Symbio Storm is a kind of cool combo, because this one actually does focus on shooting. It just basically gives a unit plus one strength to their guns. Um, this is 
I'm trying to think where this would really come in as being a super awesome thing. Like Flesh Boar as being strength 5 going to strength 6. You'd have to be up against toughness 3, 5, or 6 for that to make a mathematical difference. And uh, 3 is more likely if you're up against Imperial Guard or Tau Fire Warriors or even Sisters of Battle. Um, that can be a nice little combo to wound be wounding on 2s instead of 3s. So it's a cool power. Uh, and it obviously could have effect on some of the bigger weapons as well, but a little less so, obviously, because they're most likely you know, doing their threes to wound and not double outing. Uh, I guess like a heavy venom cannon would go to strength 10, and so that could be cool if they're up against toughness 5, but that's pretty situational. The relic is null node. Um, in your command phase, you select an enemy unit within synaptic link, and uh, basically when they go to make an attack, they cannot reroll the hit roll or the wound roll, and psychic tests cannot be rerolled. So those are two very different things, even though they all go in the same unit. So you put it on a psyker, and they're like, you can't reroll your psychic tests. And by the way, you're in my soul hunger aura, so if you roll a double, you're screwed. Um, but really putting on a unit that would normally really want to, to reroll hits and wounds, this, this relic is actually really good. Because there's a lot of things out there that let you reroll hits and wounds, if for no other reason, just command points to let that extra one get through. So that's a pretty good relic. So that actually does compete with the other relics. The deepest shadow stratagem, because it's a stratagem, you don't have to really plan to use it. It's just whenever an enemy fails a psychic test within 18 inches of one of your psychers, um, you can have them take D3 mortal wounds. And on top of that, the, that turns on an aura from, that, um, from the model that did it, that whenever they fail a psychic test, you take D3 mortal wounds. So essentially, the first time an enemy fails a psychic test within 18 inches of one of your psychers, you can have that psyker turn on an aura, which makes them take D3 mortal wounds whenever they fail a psychic test, including that time. Now imagine they failed it with a double with your soul hunger. That's just like, you don't even want to cast psychic powers around that. And so it's a pretty hard counter to certain armies like Great Knights or Thousand Sons or, or even anybody who skews into having two or three psychers in their army. So that's pretty cool. Um, now the cool thing with the lore of High Fleet Kronos, just so you know, is they're bottom feeders. And so they, they, because they don't get to eat a lot, because they're always fighting chaos, other High Fleets have been known to go ahead of them and conquer worlds that are not chaos inhabited, but not fully, not fully consume them and then just move on. And then Kronos comes and just consumes those worlds which now have no enemies to fight. It's just biomass, which is pretty cool. Also gives credence to the fact that the High Fleets are not all separate entities, that they're all part of one giant entity. Just like your hand and your foot are different from each other, and yet they're part of the same body. Same idea. The last fleet here is High Fleet Hydra, which I also really like. It's funny because I played a game where I'm like, I need to play down, so I'm going to do High Fleet Hydra because it doesn't look that good. And then I found some cool combos by accident. High Fleet Hydra is if you outnumber the enemy, when you fight them in close combat, you get plus one to hit. Um, vehicles and monsters count as five models, both for you and your enemy. So if you're fighting a monster, you need to have more than five models fighting it. Well, Hormigants really shine here, because they often outnumber the enemy, and now they're hitting on threes instead of fours. And that is terrifying. Absolutely, redonkulously terrifying. So you put Adrenal Glands on them, and uh, they're strength four, and they're getting plus one to hit. The Adaptive Trait is actually a hard one to want to get rid of. It's just plus one move. Your whole army gets plus one move. And on top of that, whenever they consolidate, they move an extra three inches. You combine that with some other stuff, and you're all of a sudden piling in and consolidating nine inches. Uh, you bring like a Parasite of Mortrex with his synaptic imperative is to give you extra piling and consolidate, and then your, your Hormigants get extra uh, either piling or consolidate, I don't remember. Either way, you're, you're going across the table, you pop the strategy for a unit of Hormigants with Adrenal Glands, they're gonna move 18 inches, because they move 10, Adrenal Glands makes them 11, Hydra makes them 12, you pop the Hormigant stratagem, which lets them move an extra six, so 18 inches. They can still charge, and then they're piling in and, and consolidating maybe somewhere between six and nine inches. Like, they are. And then you have uh, Overrun, which is after all that's done, at the end of the fight phase, they can make a move for another 12 inches. Like, they're across the table. Raveners obviously do really well here. Uh, heck, even Tyranid Warriors, if you bring them as a group of nine, are most likely going to outnumber the things that they're going to want to fight. And getting that plus one hit, so hitting on twos, that's a big deal. So... Super, so Hydra is actually kind of scary if, if you build your army for that purpose. So I, I ended up really liking it, and it's no longer like if I'm playing down. Like I, I still put it in the bottom half of the really good ones, but I don't know, maybe not. It's, it's kind of somewhere in the middle. It's hard to rank these, really, because it's all situational on how you build your army as well. 
Uh, the Warlord trait is just that you regenerate D3 wounds every turn, which is cool. Um, the, it can only regenerate itself once per turn, so I think that means you can't use a stratagem to regenerate D3 as well, because there's a one command point stratagem that lets you do that. The Psychic Power is Psychic Shriek. That one's kind of weird. You basically choose an enemy unit within synaptic range of the Psyker or within 18 inches. And then for every infantry, uh, like your infantry units within three inches, you roll three D6s and each five plus is a mortal wound. Um, every, or, and beast as well. And every monster, you get to roll, um, sorry. Oh no, sorry, oh no, no, I read it wrong. I apologize, I read this wrong. It's not each unit. Each friendly Hydra infantry model within three inches. On a five, you roll a die on a, on a five plus, it does one mortal wound. Monsters roll three dice. Now there's a maximum of six mortal wounds. Okay, okay, all right. Now the cool thing about psychic powers for, for the Tyrannids, I didn't mention this before, and I didn't catch this for the first few games that I played, is they automatically know the psychic power from the high fleet that they're in. So you don't have to choose it. So it's not like, a, do I choose this psychic power instead of catalyst, giving them a five up ignoring wounds. It's like, you don't have to. They, they just know this power. So if you're in a situation, so a group of Hormigants charge in, and the next turn, obviously, it's going to take you next turn. Or maybe your group of Hormigons were charged. And then your next turn, you're just like, ah! And it does say within three inches of that unit, so you don't actually have to charge in. You can, so you can use that move 18 inches, get them all outside of 18 inches, or of one inch of an engagement. You could probably get 10 guys right there easily. Um, and all of a you're rolling 10 dice, every five up is a mortal wound as they all just scream at you. That's pretty cool. Now that I've read that correctly. I, I read it before as units, and now I'm glad that I reread that as so models. Um, the, our, the Relic Barb Worm Infestation, I don't really like it. It's just that when you fire a ranged weapon, you reroll wound rolls. There, there's better things to do, like just get a better gun with your Relic. Critical Mass is interesting. Uh, this, is, this, is, <laughs> just, this is where it goes from awesome to redonkulous for Hormigons. I'm, I'm focusing on Hormigons here because they obviously really they shine here, but this is still going to work for other things as well. When you fight in close combat, um, if, you are t if you're up against something that has fewer models than your own, you re-roll the wound roll. Now this one doesn't say for the purposes of this count vehicles and monsters as five models. I want to point that out because over here it says for the purpose of this adaptation, vehicles and monsters count as five. So it looks like this one, you could just, if it's a vehicle and you have two things attacking it from the same unit, then you could re-roll the wound roll. So now I want you to imagine just 20 Hormigants moving 18 inches, charging, and you, there's a stratagem that if they have uh, adrenal glands, you can give them plus one attacks. Another four attacks, hitting on threes. They are strength four, so whatever they're wounding on, fours, heck, fives, but they're re-rolling the wound rolls. That is bananas. Absolutely bananas. I think that costs you three command points in total, because two command points for the, uh, the six inch move, or six inch advance and charge, because there's... Um, more than 15 Hormigons or more than 19, I can't remember which one it is. So it's going to cost you three command points to do that, but um, yuck. And then you're super piling and consolidating, you can do your overrun. Like, what's going to survive that? Like, things are going to have a hard time against that. The only thing that will really survive against this is things that say you can't reroll against me. So that could shut it down, obviously. That's all of the main high fleets. Let's go through the 15 biomorphologies and then I'm going to take a break. It won't look like it to you because the camera will just turn off and on and I'll just add it to the next part, but I can't talk like this forever without needing a break. So there's three biomorphology unit or um, categories: hunt, lurk, and feed. So hunt here. I'm going to go through them quickly, so you can kind of rather than using all the words, you have basically consolidated an extra three inches. I'm not going to choose that one hardly ever. I think I can't see a purpose of having my whole army have that rather than. Um, so basically, uh, they can fall back and shoot at minus one a hit. That's cool. Once again, not a huge winner. Uh, plus one to charge is pretty neat if you're not playing something that's already given you rerolls. Every endless multitude unit, so your termagants, hormigants, and gargoyles, can make a normal move of six inches before the game starts. That's really awesome. And here's a really cool one, ambush predators. Your whole army can heroically intervene as with their characters. Yikes! Okay, take me off of this objective just by trying to come next to me. So that's a pretty scary one. So the winners in there to me are the endless multitudes moving six inches and your whole army being able to heroically intervene. And maybe the plus one charge is okay. Um, lurk biomorphologies, they ignore AP one. They treat it as AP zero. That's okay. It's like a mini uh, armor contempt. Uh, naturalized camouflage, if you, uh, they get an extra saving throw when you're in, in light cover, basically. So if you're in light cover, now it's plus two. That can be really good with a combo with the Broodlord. 
His synaptic imperative is to give everything light and heavy cover, uh, or light covered if they have light cover, heavy cover. So you could have your gene stealers with their extended carapace being four up save, and now with that they have a two up save. Now I know that there's still there's it, it's just more against AP that doesn't really help. Big one for me though is territorial instincts. Monsters get objective secured if they have ten or more wounds. They count as five models. That's awesome. Uh, unfeeling resilience. Uh, they count as having twice as many wounds left. Never going to use that one. Synaptic ganglia. You can reroll deny the witch tests, and if when you roll a psychic power, increase its range by three. It's pretty cool. Uh, once again, it's adaptive, so I can choose that after we start. So I can be like, oh crap, you're a big psychic army. I'm going to choose synaptic ganglia, so I can reroll deny the witch. That's pretty cool. Feed biomorphologies, I think, are really awesome. Uh, some of them. Uh, there's the first one that sixes to hit or sixes to wound in close or in shooting, get an extra AP. That's okay. Um, exoskeletal stabilization. Uh, you don't when you ad advance and fire assault weapons, you don't get a penalty. You can move and fire heavy weapons without taking a penalty. And monsters can fire heavy weapons into close combat without a penalty. That's okay. Wreath and Shadow is really awesome. That's the one where your opponent cannot overwatch or set to defend. Relentless Hunger is an interesting one. Whenever you fail a charge, you move three inches. And it doesn't say which direction. So you could move, be like, oh, screw it. I'm moving back into cover or something. And then Unstoppable Swarm. This is nice. If you see a table has a lot of things that are going to give you minuses to your movement, you can choose this one. Because you ignore any or all modifiers to your move, advance, and charge. And so that's any or all. So you can keep the good ones. You can keep the pluses but ignore the negatives. And when you want to build a custom high fleet, which is fun to do too, you basically choose one biomorphology from one table, one from another one. And then before the game starts, after you know who's going first, you can swap out one of those from one from the third. So that's kind of your adaptive right there, which is pretty cool. And that is the high fleets. I'm going to take a break and come back and talk about stratagems. And I'm back. Look at that power of movie making. Didn't even see me go. Let's talk about stratagems. Now, Typically, I'm not a huge fan of stratagems in Warhammer 40k 9th edition because I find that uh, what they did when they went from 7th to 8th is they took out cool abilities that units had and they just made them stratagems, which to me was kind of not the right approach to it. But they're just kind of trying to figure them out. Now, as this book is, when this book came out, it's a lot closer to what I'd want stratagems to be, where it stops giving like individual unit stratagems, although there's still a couple exceptions to that, and more gives types of unit stratagems. Now, I know other books have that as well. Uh, but the, the old Tyranid Codex and its supplements were just full of like, here's a strategy for horror specs, here's one for an exocrine, here's one for termagants, here's one for um, this and this and this. Whereas these ones, it seems to be more like, here's a strategy for monsters, here's a strategy for things that have adrenal glands, here's a strategy for um, things that have toxin sacs, here's a strategy for things that have flesh hooks. It still suffers from some of the other ones, like for some reason there's a strategy just for exocrines that lets it ignore cover and six is to hit, do an extra hit. And I'm like, see, I'd rather that just be an ability that, that if they move half or less, they ignore cover and score extra hits rather than spending a command point to do this thing. It's kind of like smoke launchers. It always was bothered me that smoke launchers went from a once per game you could pop smoke and get a minus one to hit or cover save or whatever it was in old editions uh, to a now it's a stratagem. So you have three vehicles move forward, but only one of them is able to use its smoke launchers per turn. It's just kind of weird and it breaks a bit of the immersion and the the coolness of it. And so I'm not, not a fan of those ones. But thankfully there's a lot less of those. There, and there are ones, like, like there's one specifically for lictors, but thankfully death leapers are also lictors, so it kind of works there. Uh, it would have been cooler if it was like they gave them the pheromone trail keyword and maybe there was a way to give that to something else as well. Uh, there is one specifically for Tyranid Warriors and Primes, and one's for Exocrines, and then one for Hormigaunts. And I think... Uh, I guess there's one specifically for Tyrant Guard with their Hive Tyrants as well. See, I, I just wish that that was built into those. So, uh, like I said, this is, oh, and there's one for Toxicreens as well. Ah, so there's a lot more of these than, it, it makes it sound like a lot. But this, the cool thing is there's a lot of more generic ones. Ones that you might be familiar with from older codexes for Tyranids. But um, these seem to kind of have modified them in a way that's kind of cool. Um, so, for example, you have Scorch Bugs that give extra range to your Flesh Bores and Flesh Bore Hives. And so that's good for termagants and tyrannifexes with the flesh bore hive. Now you combine that with your kraken stuff, all of a sudden your flesh bores are now, what would that be, 22, 28 inch range, and 14 inches will give the extra AP, so that's really cool. Your voracious appetite, that's the old one from the previous book where monsters can reroll wound rolls in close combat. That's really neat. 
Adrenal surge is one of the really good ones. It's units with adrenal glands. If they charge, they get an extra attack. Unless they're monsters, they get D3 more attacks. Uh, that one it costs two command points if there's 20 models or more. Reinforced Hive Node is specifically for Warriors and Primes, that when they get targeted, for shooting or close combat, uh, you can turn on a minus one damage, which is pretty cool, because they're, they're still only three wounds. I don't know why they didn't go up to four. I'm not complaining. It's more like everything else went up by a wound, but these ones stayed at three. So minus one damage on three wounds can be really annoying to your opponent, because if they're hitting you with two damage weapons, instead of two hits, they need now three to kill you. And if they're hitting you with three damage weapons, instead of one, they need two. So that's a huge benefit right there. Observer Organism, I already said, with Exocrines, getting them the Ignore Cover. Well, like I said, I'd rather that be an ability, that if they don't move or something. Indomitable Monstrosity is gives monsters, a, a, a single monster transhuman, which is pretty cool because you can only use it on one monster, so you have to use it on a key moment that they cannot be wounded on one, twos, or threes. Obviously, if you're already a Synapse and Leviathan, you don't need this one. Um, then you have some Epic Deed Stratagems. So those are your Battle Tactic Stratagems. Epic Deed ones. Psychers can do an extra psychic power, so you can have a Psyker do their psychic powers and then spend a command point and do another one, and that comes up really good. The Malice Scepter obviously is the winner with that one because he does mortal wounds when he rolls seven or higher, and so you want him to do as many as possible. Death Frenzies, two command points on a character. When they die, they get to fight, and they fight at full strength. So a Hive Tyrant dies, or Swarm Lord dies, or Trigon Prime dies. And he cancels being at full strength when he does this. Now he has to not have not already fought, so you can't use it to fight a second time. Uh, Pheromone Trail for Lictors, if they're within six inches of an enemy in the charge phase, then everybody gets plus two to charge that enemy. And it doesn't say unless you multi-charge, so you can still like multi-charge and get that plus two. Uh, this is pretty cool because you can either take your Lictor and you can try to advance them up the field and get within six inches of an enemy, or you can use their own built-in hidden deployment where they pop up on the side of the table nine inches away, and they get to reroll charges. So they can charge in, and then they can pop the pheromone trail strategy because it says in your charge phase, not the beginning, not the end, like in. And so it can be after he charges, and you can get everybody else plus two. And because he has a reroll, he's like more likely to get in there. You can combine it with all sorts of stuff, like a synaptic lure. I'm gonna jump. Is oh, sorry, it's called. I keep calling it synaptic lure. That's a, I think that's a psychic power. Shard lure is when a synapse creature shoots. If they hit. You spend a command point, and now when everybody declares a charge against that, they get to roll an extra die and discard one of them. This is this makes uh, things like um, the uh, Turvagon even better, because the Turvagon has these spine banks, which is just basically, or Stinger Salvo, whatever it is, it's basically just strength, it's eight strength five minus one shots, which in and of itself is nothing spectacular, because the Turvagon around them will already do way more damage, but it's more like a tagging thing. It's like thunk, and you hit, you shoot it out a unit. You hit them at least once, you go one command point, now everybody gets to throw all three dice and take the best two against that one. So you can really combo this well with the Lictor, or a Death Leaper, which by the way are super awesome. You have them pop up, you have a Synapse creature shoot the thing that they want to charge, spend a command point, now they can charge three dice, take their best two, re-roll it, so they're likely to get that nine inch charge. And then they get in there, and if you're really wanting things to get in, if things are like 11 inches away or something, then you spend a command point, and now you get plus two to charge that, rolling three dice, taking your best two. And then you can command point re-roll, or if you're playing Behemoth, maybe you have built-in re-rolls if you haven't swapped that out for an adaptive. Heck, maybe you swapped it out for a plus one charge, and now it's even better. So you can see that that's some pretty powerful combos for getting deep into the enemy lines and really tagging something that you want to. Synaptic channeling, I haven't used this one yet, but it's obviously powerful. It's, probably, it's, it's good situationally because it lets you know the psychic powers from other psychers on the, on the field. So if you like gave something Catalyst and something else the horror, but then over here you're like, I really wish I had Catalyst. Now first off, most likely you're okay because psychic powers mostly can be cast through synaptic links, which means like they can hit another uh, synapse within 12, another synapse within 12, and then the target. Uh, so, but maybe, maybe you're out of synapse, synaptic link range, you're not within that. So now he can just be like, I just know your power and I'm just going to cast it right here. So just make sure that you can almost get whatever psychic power that you want to onto whatever you want, as long as you pass the test, of course. Synaptic legacy is interesting if your warlord's still alive and something and a synapse creature has died that you have not yet used their synaptic imperative for. Normally you can't, but you can spend a command point and use a dead one. Uh, as long as it hasn't already been used. Trampling charge is cool. Essentially, uh, it's for monsters. After they make their charge um, on a two plus, they do D3 mortal wounds. On a five plus, they do three mortal wounds. Now, you're never gonna use it unless you have the horned chitin keyword, which high tyrants do, malice scepters do, 
Carnifex is what tusks do. A lot of things have horn chitin. You've got to look for that keyword. If they do, then on a 2+, plus they do flat 3 mortal wounds instead of D3. And on a 5+, plus they do D3 plus 3 mortal wounds instead of 3. So that's pretty darn powerful. So as long as you roll that 2+, plus, you're doing at least 3 mortal wounds. That's a dead terminator. I don't care if you're Death Guard or not. Enfolding Strike. So Parasite of Mortrex, we'll talk about more later. But essentially, one of his attacks is basically he has to hit and wound you. And if he does, then you get implanted with, and you get infected. And you can basically, you lose objective secured and you might spawn ripper swarms. You're going to take mortal wounds. But you still have to make that one attack. And you have to hit and you have to wound. So Enfolding Strike is when the Parasite or Mortrex moves. Anything he moves over, he can choose one of those units. And on a 2+, plus, he infects them. They immediately suffer D3 mortal wounds. Unless you roll 6, it becomes 3. And, um, and they become infected. So this is super powerful. It's way easier to infect that way than by their attacks. And then, of course, you have your, your typical ones of getting extra Warlord traits and relics. And, so, and then that works the same as everybody else's. I'm going to tell you, you're going to have a hard time not spending um, four command points before the game to get two extra Warlord traits and two extra relics because they're all so good and you want them all. Um, you've got your subterranean assault, of course, when your Trigon or Trigon Prime appear. You can select a troops unit in strategic reserves and they can basically pop up with it, which is kind of what it used to do before. Rapid regeneration is now only one command point instead of two like before, and you just heal D3 on any model. That's actually quite useful at one command point. At two, I would never, I was rarely doing it, but at one, I'm always doing it. Uh, Invisible Hunter is interesting. So at the end of your turn, you can take a Lictor and just remove him, and then he can come back anywhere within nine inches of a battlefield edge and more than nine inches from enemies. Uh, so basically, just let him bounce around the table. Overrun is really powerful. So at the end of the fight phase, uh, you choose a unit that charged. That's not an engagement range, and they can just make a normal move. They FAQ this one, because this one says instead of consolidating, which doesn't make sense because you don't consolidate at the end of the fight phase. So I was playing it that we would activate it instead of consolidating, we would do this, but then the FAQ to say, no, 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 it's just at the end of the fight phase. We'll remove that instead of consolidating thing. As long as you're not within engagement range of an enemy, of course. So this is very powerful. Shard Lure already talked about. Endless Swarm. So you can bring back D3 plus 3, Hormigants, Termagants, or Gargoyles. And they have to be placed in coherency, but this lets you nab objectives, because this is in the start of your command phase you do this. So typically you get points for holding objectives at the end of your command phase. So if you're just at a range of a command, or of an objective, or if your opponent has enough objectives secured on it, you can, in that you know that D3 plus 3 will then outnumber him, then you can do that, and it's very, very powerful. Uh, Instinctive Rampage, like I said, this should be an ability on Tyrant Guard and not a stratagem. Basically, when a Hive Tyrant dies, um, you can spend a command point and uh, every Tyrant Guard basically gets plus four charge and plus one to hit and wound. Uh, but it has to be against the enemy that killed the Hive Tyrant. So that's, that's basically them going, ah, you killed my daddy, and they just charge in. Bounty in advance, we talked about before, Hormigants get to auto advance six inches and they can still charge. If there's 15 or less of them, it's one command point. Otherwise, it's two. Uh, Encircle the Prey is really cool, although they did, um, they did change this. It's less powerful than what it shows in the codex. Right now, it says at the end of your turn, but now it's the end of the movement phase. A unit that has burrow or fly um, it can basically be removed and put in reinforcements. Now, before the FAQ came out, people were basically like bombing in with a flying hive turn and then just taking off. Uh, you can't do that. You have to do it at the end of the movement phase now. So still useful but more like a Return of the Shadows for Genes of the Cult, where it's more like, I need to get to the other side of the table, so I'm just going to do that. And it's at the end of your movement phase, so you could fall back and still do it. Um, so you got Spore Clouds. When Spore Casters are selected to remain stationary, they get six inches to their unit's aura abilities. I have to admit, that's the first time I really read that one. I thought I had read every single one. I'm like, wait a second. So Spore Casters would be, uh, I'm assuming that's going to be Biovores and your... Um, Sporocysts. So let me quickly just look at those. So Biovores are not spore casters. So is it only going to be the Sporocyst? When a spore caster unit from your army. So it must be your spore mines. Hold on. I, I, it must actually be the spores themselves. Okay. Spore caster unit. I don't see anything with the keyword spore caster. Is this, I got Sporocyst, Seed Spores. I, this is, I, I'll admit, that's my first time noticing that stratagem because it's kind of down in the bottom. And 
Oh, a venom throw. Oh, spore casters. So venom throws. I wonder if toxicreens have that too. So toxicreens are also spore casters. Okay, 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 okay. I get it. I think a spore caster is like things that launch spore mines, but they mean things that are, have like a cloud around them. So venom throws have a six inch bubble of minus one to hit everything. So this one just uh, makes it 12 inches. And toxicreens have a three inch bubble of, uh, I think it's also minus one to hit. Yeah, just period. So the toxicreens three inch bubble is enemies within three inches to get minus one to hit. Whereas venomthropes are, um, when you fire at a friendly unit within six inches of it, then they're minus one to hit. So shooting specifically. And so you basically add six to that. So all of a sudden that tox screen has a nine inch aura of any enemies within nine inches get minus one to hit, which is pretty nuts. And the venom throw, that's my, that's my first time reading that. That's really cool. How did I not see that? I swear that's, I, I thought I read through everything. Somehow I missed this one. And that's, that's, uh, that's a pretty big deal. Make your venom throws 12 inch aura of minus one to hit. You do it in your movement phase. They have to remain stationary for it to work. So I guess that's something because normally you'd like move them to wherever you need the aura. So that's, that's still something. Toxic Entanglement is a Toxicrine. Um, if he hits somebody with a ranged attack, he could basically roll a die on a 2+, plus. he hugs it. So the, they get half movement. If they try to charge anything but the Toxicrine, um, first off, he has to, they have to charge the Toxicrine as at least one of their charge targets. Um, and if the Toxicrine charges, it must charge that enemy unit at least, and they get plus 2 of their charge. So they basically hug him. They're like, come here, hugs. That's pretty cool. I'm not sure, it, tox screens are going to be tough to use because of the dangly arms getting in the way, but they, they have some uses. Impaling hooks, anything with flesh hooks gets plus one to hit in close combat. So that's a, another reason to upgrade. Flesh hooks were already a good upgrade because it basically gives you almost like fly. In this case, you have infinite vertical, so you can just pass through buildings and, and solid things. Psychotropic venom is really neat. Things with lash whips are toxic lashes. So your venom throats and then of course your actual lash whips. Um, in the morale phase, you select an enemy with an engagement range, you give them minus two leadership and minus one combat attrition. So you just, you're like, zip, and, you're like, and they're like, oh, that feels weird, and uh, it makes them more likely to run. And because it's situational, you can choose to do it when you see that, oh, that minus two will make a big difference, and minus one combat attrition can be a really big deal. Acidic torrent, things with acid moss, you can upgrade your, your um, carnifexes to have this, but like your pyrovores and stuff. Basically, you can do mortal wounds in close combat. Corrosive viscera, things with acid blood, like your horror specs, you have to turn it on before it'll do mortal wounds to them. It used to just be all the time. So I don't like the fact that this is a stratagem. Essentially, whenever they take a wound on a four plus, your enemy takes a mortal wound to a maximum of six. But you gotta, you gotta turn on their acid blood. Apparently, it's not just always there. So I, that's, I just don't like that. Blinding venom, specifically for gargoyles, at the start of the fight phase, uh, you select an enemy unit with an engagement range and they can't reroll their hits and minus one to their hits. So that's pretty cool. Once again though, I'm not a huge fan of this whole like, there's a strategy for Gargoyle, there's a strategy for Hormigaunts. Uh, it feels like that should just be like a Gargoyle ability if they charge or if they hit you with their, their special flesh. Because it used to be that. They're, I think they, if they hit you with their flesh boards, you had some consequences. See, I'd rather that be cool abilities rather than all these different things to spend command points on. Because you already have enough things to spend command points on. Like, you look at Age of Sigmar, if you're familiar with that game, and you, you, you burn your command points, even with a, only a small handful of, essentially, stratagems. Pathogenic Slime, um, when you go to shoot, basically, um, if you hit six, if you roll a six to hit, they automatically wound. Now, you don't have to have Toxin Sacks to use this stratagem, but um, if you do, it only costs one command point, rather than two. So it just like, it basically makes your Toxin Sacks. Like, if you give your Termagants uh, toxin sacks, you can spend one command point and when they go to fire, six is the hit will do automatically wound. Which is kind of cool. I'm not seeing a huge use for that, but uh, it's once against a stratagem, so you can choose to activate it or not. So, yeah. Adaptive physiologies have been really interesting. So, um, these are upgrades for monsters that are not characters or titanic. And that's a, that's a big difference right there because uh, I believe it used to be, yeah, you used to be able to put it on characters as well. And so now you can't. So you can't put it on Hive Tyrants or Trigon Primes, but you could put it on Trigons and Molochs and Carnifexes and, and um, Horospexes and Toxicreens. And there's a wide variety of these. So you pay some points, anywhere from 10 to 25, and you upgrade a monster. Uh, you can't have the same upgrade on more than one monster, and a monster can't have more than one upgrade. And uh, some of them are really good. Like Dermic Symbiosis just gives your monster a 4-up invuln. That's pretty awesome. Horospex with the 4-up invuln is terrifying. Uh, enraged uh, Reserves. 
counts as twice as many wounds remaining, and it can do epic deed stratagems once per game without spending any command points. So I'll remind you, the epic deed, one of those is the trampling charge, for example. Uh, but it's also like the death frenzy. So if you, um, but then again, that doesn't work because death frenzy is on a character, so I guess it doesn't matter. So it would have to, like a malice scepter, I guess you could, you could put this on as well. And he has a horn, so he could do trampling charge, but then also he could do the psyker ones once per game. So it's basically saving you a command point. This one's, I don't find that one as interesting. Uh, hardened biology, it's, um, if it's damage one weapon that hits it, it gets plus one save. That's kind of cool. Uh, precognitive sensoria, they fight first in close combat, even if they didn't charge. That's cool. Predatory instincts, they can heroically intervene like a character, and they can heroically intervene six inches, not three. Here's a big one for me, synaptic enhancement. You basically gain synapse, shadow on the warp, all that kind of stuff. That's a big deal for continuing your synaptic link, which we haven't even gotten to yet because the order in this book is really weird. You think it would be like the basic rules for your army first, but it's not. Voracious ammunition is basically every time it shoots, after it shoots, uh, you select a unit that was hit, just one on a two plus, they take D3 mortal wounds. Uh, that's pretty cool. It used to be, Voracious Ammunition in the old one used to be if they killed a model, it would do D3 mortal wounds, which sucked against firing against like single models. Whip coil reflexes, uh, basically uh, if an enemy tries to uh, fall back away from you on a 2 plus, you do D3 mortal wounds. That, so the winners for me in adaptive physiologies are the, obviously making something a synapse creature, giving something a 4 up involved, fighting first, and the heroic intervene 6 inch one, that's pretty cool. The other ones have our situation, they're pretty cool. Warlord traits, I was telling you that there are a lot of good ones. So there are six warlord traits and they're all awesome. Alien cunning makes your warlord objective secured, count as five models and can do actions when they advance and fall back. I love this on the Death Leaper and on the Parasite of Mortrex. The Parasite of Mortrex moves 16 inches with fly and all of a sudden he can do, you can then advance him an extra D6 and he can still do actions. And by the way, now he's objective secured so he jumps on an objectives and does actions, which is pretty cool. Heightened senses is uh, pretty cool. It's one of the, it's not my top one. Uh, almost every other one is better. Basically, it fights first and rerolls hits. You might think, well, that's awesome. It's like, yes, it is. But there's so many other good ones. Uh, synaptic linchpin, you get plus three to their synaptic imperative. So that it's instead of with being within six inches of the warlord, it's nine inches. Um, and if they use any of their abilities, it's plus three. So heightened senses and synaptic linchpin, I'd say, are my the bottom of the six. Because now we have direct guidance, which you just choose a core unit in synaptic link range and they get plus one to hit. Or synaptic tendrils. Pretty much every um, character that could be a, have a warlord trait has a, in the command phase, choose a core unit within synaptic link and they get some sort of bonus. For example, hive tyrants give out a reroll one to hit. Uh, the swarm lord gives out reroll hits. Tyranid prime gives reroll ones to wound. Trigon prime gives plus one advance and charge. Neurothrope gives, when you do psychic powers, you roll three dice and take whatever two you want. The Broodlord gives plus one AP when you roll six to wound. So synaptic tendrils, instead of choosing one, they can choose two. This is very powerful on like the Hive Tyrant, although you're probably going to want a different one for the Hive Tyrant specifically. But like for the Neurothrope, because of his psychic thing, they can do it to two. Or the Tyranid Prime, to give it reroll ones to wound to two units. Or our Turvagon, who gives plus one to hit for termagants and shooting, so now you can give it to two units like the one he just spawned, that's pretty cool. And then you have Adaptive Biology, which just straight up gives your Warlord a 5-up Feel No Pain, 5-up Ignoring Wounds. It used to be that at the end of a phase in which he suffered a wound, he gains it, so he like learned. It's like, but by then you've already lost a lot of wounds, so who cares? Now it's just a 5-up Feel No Pain. That on a Hive Tyrant is scary. So, like I said, Alien Cunning's awesome on, I love it on Death Leapers and Parasite. The Synaptic Tendril, specifically on the Neurothrope or the Tyranid Prime. The Direct Guidance, is pretty much on any other warlord, which or on any other character, because remember you're gonna buy, you're gonna buy a couple extra warlord traits, um, and then adaptive biology on anything that you want to really survive, like your hive tyrants. If you have two things that you really want to survive, then you could give heightened senses to another one to let them fight first and reroll hit rolls. That's cool too. Um, by the way, if you bring Death Leaper, he has to do alien cunning, and so. But I think that's a perfect one for him. Old One Eye has to do adaptive biology, which I think is awesome for him. It gives him five up feeling of pain. And a swarm lord has to do synaptic linchpin, which I, I don't. I just don't care about that one as much. It's just a, his auras are a little bigger. Your hive mind discipline all look the same as before, but they're all slightly different. Catalyst, for example, hands out a five up ignoring wounds unless you're Titanic at six up. The horror, instead of minus one leadership and minus one to hit, is now minus two leadership and minus one combat attrition. So imagine co um, co combining that with the lash whip thing of another minus two leadership and minus one combat. So minus four leadership and minus two combat attrition. By the way, Screamer Killers, or every model they kill, you get minus one leadership up to a max of minus four. 
So you could be like minus eight leadership or even just a minus six isn't that crazy. And like a minus one or two combat attrition. That, that, that unit is running, unless they roll a one, of course, or spend two command points. Neuroparasite's very strong. You choose an enemy unit, you roll a number of dice for every model in that unit. For everyone that exceeds their toughness, they take a mortal wound, maximum six. So you got like 10 guardsmen there, you roll 10 dice, every four plus is a mortal wound. Heck, you got 10 space marines, you roll 10 dice, every five plus is a mortal wound. It's quite powerful. Onslaught is the one where you basically can fire assault weapons when you advance and, or heavy weapons when you move without any penalty, but you can also charge when you advance. That's where it's really powerful. Paroxysm, this one's incredibly powerful. You choose a unit and they can't overwatch or set to defend. Remember I said there was that whole like biomorphology that turn off your whole opponent's thing? Well, if you have somebody with a paroxysm psychic power, you don't need to have your whole army ignore it because you only really need it in key moments. Like, I'm gonna charge that unit that has really good overwatch. Well, we'll paroxysm them first. And on top of that, they get minus one of their wound rolls, just to add insult to injury. And then Psychic Scream, it's pretty boring. They you take D3 mortal wounds, and if you're a Psyker, there's a chance that you'll forget a Psychic Power if you, you roll against your leadership. That one's okay. I, I, it's, I, all the other ones are awesome. I, a catalyst all the time, um, Neural Parasite all the time, like those are my top two. And then depending on your army, Paroxysm is great, the Horror is great, Onslaught can be great, depend, once again, depending on the army that you're doing. And then Psychic Scream is like, eh, whatever. Probably never use it. Relics. Boy, are we spoiled for options in Relics. Um, some better than others, of course. The, so I'll just go through them in order. The Yum Girl Factor. Uh, basically, at the start of the fight phase, you can choose plus two strength, plus one attack, or plus one toughness. That's okay. It's, it's good. Uh, not my favorite, but it's cool. It's not random, which I like. Um, the Reaper of Obliterax is nasty, so it replaces a monstrous bone sword. And basically, if you wound, you do a mortal wound in addition, just flat out. So that, that, that uh, adrenal gland hive tyrant who charges in the battle, he give him D3 extra attacks with the stratagem, and now he rolls and he hits on a two, and he's probably wounding on twos or threes. And if he just wounds you, you take a mortal wound in addition to whatever damage he just inflicted. And um, all the wounds from that weapon ignore anything that ignore wounds. Now, some people might argue that, well, that ignores things like the Death Guard minus one damage. I don't, I don't think that's what it means. I'm pretty sure it just means like the abilities like on a five up, I ignore wounds, or on a four up, I ignore wounds, or on a six up, I ignore wounds. What they call ward saves in, in Age of Sigmar, or Feel No Pains is what the Universal Special Rule used to be, because universe, Universal Special Rules are awesome and they should come back. The Maw Claws of Thyrax, that's a cool close combat one as well. Gives you plus one attack, reroll wound rolls, and every time you kill a unit, in close combat, you get plus one attack for the rest of the game to maximum of three. This works thematically well on a Broodlord, but honestly, it's good on anything. A Resonance Barb is for Psychers only. They get plus one Psychic Test, and they can know one more power. That's pretty cool. Not one of the more powerful ones, but it's nice. Pathogenesis, I'm not as big a fan of this one anymore. It used to be really cool. Plus eight inch range to your range weapons. It reroll one hit roll. Um, and one, one, one wound roll. Now you might think, well, that's really powerful, but the thing is, we're gonna get to some relic weapons that I'd rather put on the, on the characters that have a gun that I would care about doing that with. So we have one more close combat, one size of Tyrant, it replaces the two monster scything talons, um, and instead, a size of Tyrant, is they still get the two extra attacks, but now it's instead of strength user, it's strength plus two, instead of AP minus three, it's minus four, instead of damage two, it's damage three. So basically you're almost getting like Carnifex um, Scything Talons, but with extra strength. So you put that on a Hive Tyrant with Adrenal Glands and your strength 10, minus four, three damage a swing. That's pretty scary too. Uh, and you get extra attacks, whereas the Bone Swords don't get extra attacks. The, the monstrous ones, that is. But here's where the Pathogenesis gets overshadowed. So you basically, you have a Relic uh, Stranglethorn Cannon, which is your large blast basically one, and then you got a Relic Heavy Venom Cannon. So the Stranglethorn Cannon, I'm going to do a quick comparison here so you can kind of see the difference between the two. So normally a Stranglethorn Cannon on a Hive Tyrant or a Carnifex, although you can't give the Relic to the Carnifex, is a 36 inch range. It's D3 plus 3 blast, strength 8 minus 2, 2. It's good, it's good, I like that. But now it's same number of shots, Instead of strength eight minus two, two, it's strength 10 minus three, three. Scary, super scary. Um, and in the shard gullet, the heavy venom cannon, it, normally heavy venom cannon is three shots flat, strength nine minus three, four. Already scary, right? Well, this one's strength 12 minus five, five. And it's no longer heavy, it's assault. Which means in close combat, you're gonna have less penalties. 
It also means you can advance and still fire it, albeit at a minus one. That is redonkulously scary. Very, very scary. And the Shard Gullet is probably one of the big winners in Relics when it comes to shooting weapons because um, that, that three, like three shots hitting on twos from a Hive Tyrant that are strength 12, minus five, five. Like you'll get an invuln, so it's not quite the Tau uh, rifle or the rail rifle from the, um, from the, oh geez, I can't even, the hammerhead. It's not quite that because it doesn't ignore invulns, but boy does that thing do damage. So that's pretty scary. Uh, then our last one is Gestation Sacks, a fun one. Once per battle, they can do an action in the shooting phase, so instead of shooting, and they can spawn D3 plus one Ripper Swarms. That's just some free units, and it doesn't cost reinforcement points. The Dirge Heart of Karis is an interesting one. When you fight, you select an enemy unit. After you fight, you select an enemy unit that was hit, and they lose objective secured and minus one leadership until the end of the next turn. So during their next turn, they're no longer objective secured. So it's good for uh, sn uh, snagging objectives. The Passenger, uh, it replaces Adrenal Glands, Oh, sorry, it doesn't replace. You have to already have adrenal glands. You get plus two advance and plus two charge. That's pretty fast. And seer hive, you have to have toxin sacks. Um, if you hit in close combat, like unless it's a monster vehicle, you just automatically wound. That one is less cool because most likely you're going to want like to replace your bone sword with this one or your scythe and talons with the one that gives you more strength and more damage, all that kind of stuff. So. Not as cool. So the, the, the top winners for shooting, obviously the Balethorn Cannon and Shard Gullet are awesome. For close combat, the Reaper of Obliterax and the Size of Tyrants, so replacing the Bone Sword, replacing the Size of Talons are awesome. For utility, the uh, Gestation Sack for getting those extra Ripper Swarms, the Dirge Heart for removing Objective Secured, those are really good as well. And then you got some extras, because they're all, actually, there's not one on here, except for maybe Pathogenesis. Uh, even that one's okay. Where I'm just like, ah, I don't really see the use. All of them are actually kind of good. Then we have some chapter approved rules, which I will admit I have not even looked at because I haven't played GT for um, a very long time. I love playing Open War, and in this case, we've been playing a lot of Tempest of War, which I think is so awesome. And then we've got the Crusade rules, which I think are awesome, but I haven't played them yet. So I'd rather talk about that maybe at a later time. Let's keep going. So now we get to the actual data sheets, and this is where they actually start to explain some of the rules. For example, Synapse, your Synapse creatures have a six inch aura where you ignore, you automatically pass morale tests. And Shadow on the Warp, which I already talked about, 18-inch aura from anything that's Synapse, basically. That Psychers get minus one Psychic test, and they get an extra Mortal Wound when they peril. Uh, another cool rule that they added in is Swarming Masses. So your Termagants, Hormagants, and, and Gargoyles get to fight if they're within two and a half inches of the enemy units. Essentially, lets them fight in three ranks. Normally, it's like you're within half an inch, and then within half an inch of half an inch. So it's almost like two ranks. This lets you basically fight in a third rank. So you get Hormagants, that makes them way more powerful. And Gargoyles and Termagants too. And then Death from a Blow, it just explains that these units can go in reserve and then pop up anywhere on the table more than nine inches away. It explains Synaptic Links, which is basically when it says, if something's in Synaptic Link range, well, what's in Synaptic Link range? So you have a Synapse creature here. If you have in, in Synaptic Link range for it, it would be anything within 12 inches. But if there's another Synapse creature within 12 inches, you can actually bounce to that one and look at its 12 inches. And you can keep doing this. So if you have a synapse creature here, 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 and here, all within 12 inches of each other, and you have an enemy, or you have an enemy unit within 12 inches or a friendly unit you're trying to affect, you can actually use your ability and bounce it all the way through. I love this, by the way, because it makes me feel like I'm, it's, it's like my whole army is one giant Death Star, but more importantly, it feels like one large brain, like I'm connecting their synapses together. It also means your opponent, if they're smart, will try to sever that synaptic link, and so you can't use certain abilities, which is pretty cool. Um, so then we get to synaptic comparatives before we finally get to the data sheets of all the different units. So synaptic comparatives, I already explained, every type of synapse creature that is already synapse, so not ones that you like may become synapse, have a synaptic comparative. And at the beginning of every battle round, after you know who's going first, by the way, um, you, you basically select one of the synaptic comparatives, which is pretty cool. Um, and it affects your whole army as long as they're within six inches of any synapse creatures. And even if they're not in synaptic link range, so you have these two synapse creatures that are far apart from each other, they'll both have that aura of whatever this is. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of them, one for each type of synapse creature. And you can only use each of them once. Uh, there are some ways to use the second time, like Leviathan Psychic Power is the main one right now. So Hive Tyrants, they create a bubble of you can fall back and charge. Pretty cool. So your whole army can fall back and charge if they're within six inches. I want you to keep reminding that. Broodlords is actually pretty cool. It gives your whole army infantry, light cover, and if they already have light cover, it gives them heavy cover. 
The Tyranid Prime, pretty cool. Everybody who shoots, if they uh, roll a 6 to hit, they have to target a unit within 24 inches. If they roll a 6 to hit, it gets 2 hits instead of 1. Uh, or one additional hit. The Turbagon is really useful. It gives you plus two to your move when you normal move in advance. So that's, that's, pretty, uh, that's pretty powerful. Neurothrope gives all of your psychers plus one psychic test, plus one deny the witch. And, every, and everybody gets five up ignoring mortal wounds. It doesn't say from psychic power, it just says mortal wounds. So that's really powerful for getting your psychic tests off and a little bit of protection against mortal wounds, man. Trigon Prime is kind of a weird one. Normally your monsters explode on sixes. Now the explode for the monsters in Tyranids now is that the nearest enemy unit within six inches takes a number of mortal wounds, uh, which is, so it's not quite exploding, it's more like they get really mad, a, a death throw. So if you activate the Trigon Primes, then they do that on threes instead of sixes. I, I just don't know. I have used this once before only because I had no other synaptic comparatives to do, and it actually did something, but it's, I don't know why I never choose it over something else. Tyranid Warriors are really good. Uh, six is a hit in close combat, do an extra hit. Maliceptor, everybody can um, shoot and perform psychic powers without failing actions, and they can fall back and advance and still do actions. Zone Thropes, of course, is very powerful. Monsters gain four up in Vuln, and everybody else gains five up in Vuln. And Parasite of Mortrek, everybody can pile in and consolidate an extra three inches. So I want to give you some scenarios so you can kind of see how powerful this is. So you don't know who's going first. And you're looking at the table and you're like, oh, I'm kind of exposed. And then you roll off and your opponent's going first. And you're like, okay, I'm going to turn on the Zone Thropes Warp Shielding. So my whole army has five up in Vuln unless their monsters is four up. So that makes us, if he's like a good shooting army from that distance. If you look at his army and it's like, well, I don't, he's not going to be able to be that powerful. He's more mid-range shooting. Then you turn on your Turvagon Surging Vitality and you give your whole army plus two to their move if they normal move or advance. Or um, those are usually the, first, the two first, first turn ones that I like to use. Now, obviously, you're not always going to have those. Although, if you're building a good Tyranid list, you're usually going for like a Highlander approach where you have like one of each or a lot of the different Synapse creatures. Heck, the Broodlord is not even a bad choice. He might not be great, but his Synaptic Imperative is pretty awesome. So you're about to go and he pops. Everybody has light cover and then possibly heavy cover as well. So those are your good first turn ones. And then as you get it stuck in, like now you're about to get stuck in, well, you can pop the Tyranid Warriors, sixes to hit, become two hits. Or maybe you're a shooting army and you're about to unload a lot of shots. Well, then you do the Tyranid Prime, sixes to hit, score an extra hit when it comes to shooting. Either way, it gives you, it combined with the adaptive trait of your high fleet, where you can swap that out at the beginning of the game, you, having this lets you really react to how the game is going. And if you, and it's, it's actually a hard choice. I've, I've rarely been like, oh, this is the obvious choice, unless I'd have no choices left. That to kind of react to everything that your opponent is giving you, and you're able to then choose the one that works really well. And you really want to experiment with these ones that you maybe don't think are great, like Parasite of Mortrex, plus three to pile in and consolidate. You're like, eh. But I've played games, especially with High Fleet Hydra and those Hormigaunts, where that extra pile in and consolidate just gets them so far across the table that they just, they jump on objectives, they, they tag enemy units. Uh, they, it's, it's, it's a big deal that they can really do that. And of course, you always have access to that, um, that the stratagem that if your Synapse creature dies before you have a chance to use it, as long as your Warlord is alive, you can still use it as for a, for a command point. And then a Leviathan Psychic Power letting you take one of those and put it on a unit is pretty cool as well. It lets you keep a certain unit. Maybe you want that Invalm there, or you want the Maliceptor so you can always advance and fall back and do whatever the heck actions that you want as well. So now to compare it is very powerful. Now before I get into all the data sheets, I'm going to take my second break, because I've been talking for a long time, as you've probably been listening. So by the power of movie magic, you will see me barely leave you for more than a second or two. So I'll be right back for all the data sheets. Okay, let's talk about data sheets. So we're just going to go through this, not alphabetically, but the order that's in here. And I want to talk about each thing. So we're going to start with the Hive Tyrant. So we've got a Winged Hive Tyrant, a Hive Tyrant, and the Swarm Lord, which is also a Hive Tyrant. It's interesting they've actually split up the Winged Hive Tyrant from this, which at first I was like, why would they bother to do that? Because you're just making an upgrade. When I realized there's significant differences between the Winged Hive Tyrant and the Hive Tyrant which is all based on how the model is modeled, which is interesting, because some of the things that even they sold it from Forge World, like the double twin devourers, are no longer legal weapons, because it doesn't come in the kit. Which is kind of a weird move, considering they actually have Forge World bits to do it, and people definitely have upgraded their winged hive tyrants to have those, but, you know, it is what it is. So the major difference between the winged hive tyrant and the hive tyrant, first off, besides the fact that the winged hive tyrant flies, 
in a 16 inch move as opposed to 9 inch is that the winged hive tyrant is a little squishier. It's toughness 7 with a 3 up save and the hive tyrant is toughness 8 with a 2 up save. Furthermore, two of the arm slots are taken up by the wing. So typically tyranids are six limbed creatures. Two of them are the legs typically and then you usually have four arms for you to do other stuff. So you'll see like two guns and then two weapons usually. Your typical flying or your typical hive tyrant of course is like the bone sword lash whip and then underneath is some sort of big gun like the heavy venom cannon. That's your like poster boy, Hive Tyrant. But since the winged Hive Tyrant has the arms taken up by the wings, they only lose two slots. So in the past, the Forge World, came, Forge World came out, they could still take more weapons, which I always thought was weird because, you know, based on their own canon, they shouldn't. Um, but, you know, you just kind of had these double devourers or whatever you're trying to do. So now they actually do take up. So no matter what, you're stuck with those winged weapons, which suck really bad. Tyrant Talons are just one damage each. They give you two extra attacks at uh, strength user minus three one damage. They're, they're useless. Um, and so the other slot, you can uh, basically put your typical stuff, a heavy venom cannon, a strangle thorn cannon, two monster scything talons, or bone swords. Um, so the wing type turn, not really gonna be useful for shooting anymore, which is what it used to be. It used to be all about flying around shooting. Now it's all about close combat because you basically wanna give it either the relic bone sword or the relic scything talons, and then you just move up and you just destroy your opponent. And then with the, um, well, you can't use the overrun, you can use the overrun stratagem now. So they charge, and as long as they kill whatever they're killing, the overrun stratagem basically says at the end of the fight phase they can just make a normal move. So it moves 16 inches, or 17 if you give it adrenal glands. Of course, you're going to give it adrenal glands. And so you can actually still have your tyrant guard, which are bodyguard to the hive tyrants. So you can, like, jump forward, kill something, jump back, and still be protected, which is pretty cool. Or just have that mobility of wherever you want to go. But it definitely does suffer from the um, less... Uh, less resilience than a regular Hive Tyrant. Regular Hive Tyrant, the real big advantage here, which I like it, I, I like them both, because the Winged Hive Tyrant obviously is more mobile, and so it's good for just picking off things and it's scary to your opponent. The regular Hive Tyrant is scary because, well, not only can you have that really cool close combat weapon, but you can also throw a Relic Heavy Venom Cannon or a Relic Stranglethorn Cannon on the bottom, or a non-Relic one if you really want to, and just have it just deal out damage from a distance as well. And then it still moves nine inches, it's still pretty fast. Uh, and Toughness 8 with a 2-up save. And they both have 4-up invulns, I should point out. So the save is, is something to think about. It's less important because there's a lot of AP weapons now in the game. But still, the 2-up instead of a 3-up is a big difference. Both of the Hive Tyrants functionally act the same in that they both hand out their uh, Will of the High Mind, which is a core unit getting reroll ones to hit. The Swarm Lord, um, he actually is, he, he still is really good in close combat like he used to. Uh, arguably better than the Hive Tyrant in close combat, but it's a little hard. It's, it's slightly different because he's strength 9 minus 4, 3 in close combat. And with the Bone Swords, the Hive Tyrant with Adrenal Glands is strength 11 minus 4, 3. So higher strength, but then he only has 5 attacks on the Hive Tyrant and you'll have 9 on the Swarm Lord. Um, and so the Swarm Lord is stronger in close combat, but has no options to be shooting as well. Uh, on top of that, it's the same level Psychic does to manifest 2. Oh, sorry, it can deny two instead of denying only one, so it's a slightly better at denying. Um, but instead of handing out a reroll one to hit, he hands out reroll everything to hit to a core. And on top of that, he has Hive Commander, where he chooses a core unit in synaptic link range and gives them objective secured. If they already had that, then they count as twice as many models, which is really cool. Somebody asked a question that's just all of a sudden popped in my head, and I'm pretty sure I know the answer. But yeah, Carnifexes are core. I should point that out. So that's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, anyway. And then he has Blade Parry. So he's really good in close combat, basically. The first time he fails a saving throw in close combat, he can just reduce the damage to zero. And so essentially the first time he fails a save, he, you can basically treat him as passing it. Um, although some things ignore the saves, in which case you still get to reduce the damage to zero, which is kind of cool. So the Hive Tyrants are really, really strong. Um, they're part of powerful lists. You can only bring one per detachment, so if you want to bring two, got to have two detachments. you got to pay the extra command points for it, which I wouldn't, I don't think I'll, I'll, maybe you'll see me do it in one game out of 30, but it won't be something I do very often. But definitely on your list of things you want in your, in your army. Uh, Broodlord, uh, like the Gene Stealers, as I'll talk later, their function has really changed. They used to be the shock troops. Now they're more like the infiltrating, we're going to sneakily go around and do uh, actions and grab objectives. You don't really want to fight them in close combat. The Broodlord's okay in close combat. Six attack, strength five, minus three, two damage. Rerolling wound rolls. But two damage is not a great thing in the current meta. Um, he does hand out uh, 
sixes to wound to do an extra AP in close combat. And he can be deployed anywhere on the table more than nine inches from enemies and their deployment zone. So he infiltrates essentially. And so the thing where he really shines though is his snap to comparative, handing out light cover to everything that's infantry. So I like him for that reason, but he's not really one of your top HQs. The Neurothrope on the other hand, very powerful, uh, mainly because he can cast two psychic powers. He gets plus one to his psychic test. He still has a three up invuln, unlike the other zone throats, which are four up now. Um, and basically he can heal Neurothropes and Zonethropes as long as enemies take mortal wounds in the psychic phase within 18, doesn't matter how. And then his thing, because like I said, every HQ choice has like a command phase hand out this thing. His is Warp Siphon. Um, basically when the psychic test is taken, for a, you, you choose a unit, a psychic unit within synaptic range and they roll three dice and pick two for their, their psychic test, which is very powerful. The Tyranid Prime, so that is your character warlord or warrior, I really like him too. He's, he's good in close combat, he's good at shooting, but he's not very expensive, so he's one of your cheaper HQs. He hands out reroll ones to wound, and then remember his synaptic imperative is sixes to shoot and do two hits instead of one. Uh, I didn't mention the Neurothropes. The Neurothropes is the plus one psychic test for everybody and some others, and five of ignoring mortal wounds, uh, which is pretty cool against certain armies. So the Tyranid Prime, he liked the warriors, he's got a lot of flexibility. I like him with uh, bone swords and a venom cannon and uh, just use them that way with adrenal glands, of course. Maybe flesh hooks and toxin sacks as well. But he's really a support character, handing out that reroll once to wound, which is pretty cool. So he's the kind of guy that you can give a warlord trait or relic that you're, you're not quite, you don't want to waste it on somebody else. You can give it to a tier of prime. So he's really useful that way. But often he gets overshadowed by other ones. The Turvagon is a huge winner in the new codex. The Turvagon has gotten stronger in close combat, but not like stupid strong, just like surprisingly strong in close combat. Uh, the, especially if you give him Scything Talons, because then he has the option to sweep or just to stab. So he can do lots of damage or more, more attacks. But his thing is he spawns Termagants. Now the way this used to work is that he could bring back up to 10 Termagants with Flesh Bores in a unit. You couldn't spawn a unit of 10 unless you had reinforcement points set aside. But now he can either bring back 2d6 Termagants from a unit, or he can create a new unit of 10 once per game without spending reinforcement points. And that's essentially, what is that, 60 or 70 points? Off the top of my head, I can't remember. Um, but that's just free points. And so basically in your first turn, you usually spawn the 10 Termagants and then you use the rest of the game, you're regenerating them as well. Unless you get hit pretty hard, then you might regenerate it and then maybe spawn them later. He also hands out a plus one to hit to Termagants and um, when shooting, so they can hit on threes. But what's really cool that they changed is that if there's at least 15 Termagants within an inch of him, meaning like a unit of 15 or more, I should say, then you can't shoot the Termagant because there's all the Termagants in the way. It's called Wall of Flesh. If there's a Termagant unit within an inch with 15 or more, um, and they're closer to the enemy, obviously. It's like a lookout, sir. They basically get a lookout, sir. This is a 17 wound. Toughness 8, 2 up save monster that you cannot shoot if there's this wall of Termagants. So you're, fire, you're forced to fire at the Termagants, which if you don't kill, the Hive Tyrant will, or the Termagant will bring them back and their objective secured. Not the ones he builds, because the ones he spawns are not technically part of your detachment, so they don't get the objective secured. Then you got the Trigon Prime. So he's been moved to HQ. He used to be over in the fast attack or heavy support, and now he is an HQ choice, which I really like because then you can really thematically create an army. And um, he's got his, his Synaptic Comparative, which I think is the dumbest one, which everybody explodes on threes instead of sixes. I'm not sure when you would want to use that, except like I said, because you'd be like, oh, when you're, all your monsters are about to die. It's like, well, if you're all about to die, then you're about to lose, most likely. Um, and, but he, he's, he's pretty good. Like, I, I think he's probably one of the lower tier HQs, in my opinion. He can hit okay, he's got 12 attacks, but they're two damage attacks, which a lot of things are minus one damage. You can buff him with relics and stuff, but you can buff any guy with relics, so you have to look at where they are. He is minus one to hit in close combat, because the serpentine coils apparently is hard to hit. And he hands up plus one advance and plus one charge to a core unit. So that's actually pretty good, um, which is pretty neat. And up until, I should point out, all the battle reports are recorded up until now, I didn't realize Carnifexes were core. So that's a mistake on my end. But you'll see that in one or two games where I'm like, oh, I don't have any core units to hand it out to. It didn't really end up being a big deal in any of the games, but it just makes it that much more valuable to have Carnifexes. So that's neat. That's the Tyranid Prime right there. And then lastly, but certainly not, certainly not leastly, we got Old One-Eye. Old One-Eye is super bananas. He's, he's awesome. I love him. 
He's the only HQ that's not a Synapse creature, unfortunately. He does have Horn Chitin, though, so he can do that extra Mortal Wounds on the charge. Um, and, and he's awesome. So he's got six attacks base, but he gets... Card effects normally get plus one attack on the charge. He gets D3 plus one extra attacks on the charge. So he's going in there on average with... Uh, well, that would be like nine attacks on average with his Monster's Crushing Claws, which are strength 10 minus four, because he's got the Chitin Thorns giving him plus one AP. So strength 10 minus four. D3 plus 2 damage. I don't know what we'll like to get hit by that. And then he still gets two more attacks with his monster scything talents because he's got two of them at strength 6 minus, three, uh, minus 4, 2. And then he's got a tail. He makes three attacks at the strength 4 minus 1, which is pretty cool. He hands out a plus 1 to hit to a Carnifex within 9 inches, not Synaptic Link range, which makes sense because he's not a Synapse creature. So he could not have Synaptic Link. So that's pretty cool. And all, like all current effects is minus one to damage him. And he's toughness seven with a two up save. So this, he's awesome. I love him. I, I love old one eye. He's just, he's always been one of my favorite characters. Um, and so I might have a bias towards that. So he's definitely up there in my mind as a, a really good choice, but he's not like a, he's not a good support choice like all the other synapse ones. He's, he's more just a beat stick. On to our troop choices of which we have several really good choices. The first one is Tyranid Warriors, which I think are the big winners in our troop choice slot, because they are just so powerful. They are now toughness five, uh, instead of toughness four like they used to be. They're strength five instead of strength four. They went from being like okay at shooting and okay at close combat to being bananas, bananas at both. Um, they got three built-in attacks, uh, but if you give them dual bone swords, then they'll have four attacks. And those four attacks will, with adrenal glands will be strength eight minus two, two. Now I know I said before, uh, two damage is not like the best, but on this, just, uh, on this warrior squad, that's pretty awesome. On top of that being movement seven with adrenal glands, give them flesh hooks for cheap, which lets them just move vertically without paying the, the cost. So you can just move through terrain that's normally impassable without any problem. And it's pretty awesome. And then, so my ideal loadout for them is dual bone swords, and then death spitter at the bottom with your venom cannons and barb stranglers, of course. I actually don't even like the barb stranglers. I would just go with uh, one in every three is a venom cannon and the rest of them are death spitters. So if you have a unit of nine of them, for example, you have six death spitters, that'll be, um, that'll be 18 shots hitting on threes, strength five minus two at a 24 inch range. And then you'll have three venom cannons, which are D3 blast shots each, strength eight minus three, two damage. So that's pretty good. Then you get to close combat and you're four attacks each at strength eight minus two, two. Uh, if you, because you have adrenal glands, you could make that five attacks each. Alternatively, another fun build, but not as powerful, but really fun is to give them just Scything Talons. And they'll have seven attacks each. Uh, with adrenal glands, it'll be strength six minus one, um, which can be kind of fun. But uh, the bone swords, I think, are the winners. And I think this, if you're wanting to play, play them as good as possible, I think there's no reason to not give them the gun and close combat. That way they can be doing damage as they're off in the distance, and then once they get in there, they still have the, the hitting power. Because if you give them two sets of bone swords, they will get an, an, another attack, but I still think that one attack is worth giving up three strength five minus two shots all your shooting attacks. So that's pretty good. Um, what's cool too is they've actually made it so you can bring a lot of HQs. I haven't played a game yet where it mattered. So for every warrior squad you bring, you can bring a Tyranid Prime without it taking an HQ slot if you want. Um, like I said, I haven't run into that. It's Genes to the Cult, I ran into that more often, and so I appreciated those ones kind of working that way. But the Tyranids, I haven't been like, oh, I really wish I could bring six HQs. Termagants, of course, are stupid awesome now. I don't know why they made their flesh boards 18 inch range, strength five minus one. They used to be 12 inch range, strength four AP nothing. Um, but now they're that. So they actually, are, they hit pretty hard. With the Turvagon supporting them, they're gonna be hitting on threes and respawning them as well. And they're endless multitudes, so you can bring, bring back D3 plus three with the stratagem. So Termagants are awesome. Hormagants I didn't like at first. I thought there wasn't much purpose for them because the warriors could do their job better. But as I've played them more and more, I've realized that uh, even though it's expensive, adrenal gland hormagons are actually really good. Even though it's 10 points a model for a toughness three, five up save model, that'll die really, really easily. The fact that with adrenal glands, they'll move 11 and you have a stratagem to make them move 17 and still be able to charge is pretty awesome. And on top of that, being strength four minus one, the minus one's a little less different or a little less important now with uh, uh, everybody having armor contempt kind of stuff. But uh, they, can, they can basically get across the table and do a lot of damage really quickly. Gargoyles are now troop choices. I would be excited about this, except I don't like gargoyles because the models are so annoying to move around. It is impossible to hide them, but they're obviously fast. They move 12 inches, but Hormagons move 10. But gargoyles have the, the flesh bores like Termagants do, but they can't be buffed like Termagants by Turvagons. So 
it, but they, they, they serve a purpose, but it feels like the Termagants can do the shooting better, and the Hormigants can do the close combat better, and the movement better. Well, not better, because they're not, they're 11 inches with no fly, and these are 12 inches with fly, but they're just so big and bulky that it's, they take up a bigger footprint, and so that's kind of annoying. And so, I'm not a big fan of Gargoyles. I'd say out of the four choices, I would rank them Warriors, Termagants, Hormigants, Gargoyles. But that doesn't mean you won't see me bring them, because, because they're all good. Gargoyles are still good. Um, it gives me the option to do what I want. There are no options for Gargoyles, though. You just bring them with flesh bores. No adrenal glands, no toxin sacs, none of that kind of stuff. So they don't really mix well with any of the stratagems either. On to our elite choices, of which there are many. We've got the wonderful Toxicrine, which if it wasn't for the model having those gigantic arms making it impossible to move around, it's actually kind of decent now. It's not super good in close combat. It's got 12 attacks that are only one damage, but it's more the utility. He's got a three inch aura of minus one to hit. And that's just not just against him, but anybody. So if he's in close combat, he's giving that out. He's got a once per turn, if you try to fall back away from him, he can basically try to stop you from doing that on a three plus or two plus of your infantry. Uh, he also does mortal wounds to you at the start of the fight phase. Every unit on a 4 plus within engagement range takes a D3 mortal wounds. Uh, and then he's got access to some stratagems to help him out as well. Overall though, not the, the winner in the elite slot. Tyrant Guard, I love now. They're in units of 3 to 6. I believed you could only have 3 before. And they're actually pretty fun to play with Hive Tyrants. I brought them in the first few games and I had a lot of fun. You can give them adrenal glands, make them move 7 inches and make them rather decent. Crushing Claw seems to be the best weapon for them, although it's also the most expensive. But you give them Adrenal Glands and Crushing Claws, and all of a sudden they're Strength 9, minus 3, 2 damage, and Movement 7. And uh, basically, if they're within 3 inches of a Hive Tyrant, first off, they give Lookout Sir to that Hive Tyrant, even if there's less than 3 of them. And even though the Hive Tyrant has more than 9 wounds. And on top of that, they get plus 1 attack when they're close to a Hive Tyrant as well. And then, of course, we have that one stratagem that we talked about earlier. That if the Hive Tyrant dies, he pops the strat, and for the rest of the game, they get plus 4 to charge that unit, and plus 1 to hit and wound that unit, as they're very, very mad. And so that is, that is a death sentence from anybody else. And what's interesting is that for every Hive Tyrant you bring, you can bring a unit of Tyrant Guard without taking up a, an Elite slot, which you got like six Elite slots in the Battalion, so not a big deal. But in case you're needing that extra Elite slot, they are there. And so, yeah, Crushing Claws is definitely your winner for power. And then, of course, your default Bone Cleaver will be slightly less expensive because you're not paying for two Crushing Claws. Because yeah, you have to pay for both of them, not just one. The Lictor and Death Leaper, I love. At first when I read them, I'm like, eh, whatever. But as I've played them, definitely winners in the elite slots, especially the Death Leaper. So both Lictor and Death Leaper are fast, 10 inch move. They hit on twos. They've got strength seven, minus three, two damage attacks. Death Leaper has one more attack than the Lictor's six. They both have a, uh, the, the Lictor has a five up involve and the Death Leaper a four up. It's minus one to hit them. And if they're more than 12 inches away from whoever's shooting them and they're benefiting from any kind of cover, so your monger giving them dense cover at more than 12 inches, you cannot shoot them. You can't see them. And they always fight first. And they can be hidden deployment where they're not on the table, and they, they set up on turn two or three, wholly within six inches of any table edge, more than nine inches from enemies, and they can reroll charges. They have access to that stratagem to give everybody else plus two to charge, whatever they get close to. The Death Leaper takes it all the way up. He dials it to 11, though. He adds in two more abilities. Within, if you're within six inches of him, you cannot start actions. That hasn't really come up for me, but what has come up is fear of the unseen. If you're in engagement range with a Death Leaper, you can't use stratagems. So you charge something that you don't want to interrupt, but then you can actually go and fight over somewhere else. So you, you do a double charge, which is always scary if somebody has command points, because you fight over here, and then they interrupt over here. So you put a Death Leaper over here, and then you can fight here first, and this guy can't interrupt because the Death Leaper is within engagement range, and while you're within engagement range, you can't use stratagems. That includes transhuman, that includes uh, interrupting, that includes, hey, you can't re-roll anything against me because I'm custodies. You can't do any of those, which is pretty awesome. Um, and then he can, he can actually do a bit of damage as well, but he's less about damage dealing and more about the support. The Malice Scepter, of course, was the talk of the town and probably will continue to be even if they adjust his points or they, they modify it. Like they, basically, he was just, he's just too, he's too good. I, I won't be bringing him very often because he's just a little too good. Essentially, he's a powerful psyker. He can cast two. And, um, and he, anytime he rolls seven plus to, on a psychic test, if he's at full wounds, he'll do three mortal wounds to the nearest enemy unit within 12. So you got two psychic powers. You hand him up the Neurothropes, roll three dice, take your best two. And most likely you're getting seven pluses every time. You're getting three mortal wounds, three mortal wounds, plus whatever mortal wounds those spells are doing. On top of that, he has, a, he has a psychic action, which normally means you can't do psychic powers. 
that he turns on an aura of minus one strength to shooting weapons. So he always said that before as a stratagem, now it's an aura for psychic action. But the Malaceptor synaptic imperative is that you can do psychic, one of the things is that you can do psychic actions and still do psychic powers. They did clarify in the FAQ that that does take up one of your psychic tests. So basically you don't get to do the psychic action and two psychic powers, but there is a stratagem that you can do an extra psychic power. So you can still pop it three times. So psychic action for en encephalic diffusion and then two psychic powers. And so you get the Neurothropes roll three dice, and, um, and on top of that you're going to be doing most likely nine mortal wounds in addition to whatever those psychic powers were, which is kind of bananas. And then he's decent in close combat as well. Uh, he's a little, he's survivable, he's got a four up invuln with toughness eight, 15 wounds, and a three up save. Um, and, and he can actually punch a little bit in close combat. So, and he's got, he's got a horn, so he can do the extra mortal wounds in the charge too. So he's obviously good. They, they've, they've, in the FAQ made him a little less worth a while, and hopefully they'll up his points as well, that'll make him a little less good, but he's still going to be a solid choice for the fact that he's a synapse creature and he has that synaptic imperative and, he, and, he, and synaptic link will continue all the way around him as well. Um, so yeah, so that's the Maliceptor, obviously a win. Pyrovores, obviously buffed as well, they're really good. Um, they, they're beefy, they're toughness five, five wounds of the three up save. They only move five inches, they, they move slowly up the board, but you can drop them in with a you, either with a Yormonger uh, strat to make them deep strike, or you can put them in a Tyrannocyte to let them get dropped off from the transport, as we'll talk about them later. And they have their, their flame weapon, they have two, two profiles. The super scary one is a 12 inch D6 auto hits, because it's a flamer, um, and it's strength six minus two two. So that's a marine killer right there. But if maybe your opponent's a little too far away, you can do your pyro gout, which is twice as many shots, two D6, but it's only strength four minus one. So that's your like horde clear. In close combat, it's okay as well. It's got three attacks that are strength six minus three one damage. It does have the acid mock keyword, so you can pop that one strat to do mortal wounds in close combat as well. And it does have acid blood, which means you can use the other strat to do mortal wounds to the enemy when they're attacking them in close combat. And since they have five wounds, that's five chances per pyrovore to roll that four up and return a mortal wound. So they basically are, they're beefy. You have to actually put some effort into killing them. Toughness five, five wounds. I don't know a weapon that isn't designed to kill a huge monster that'll just effectively kill them. You're going to have to put some effort. And if you do put the big titan killing weapon into them, that means you're not firing at something else. The Haro specs I love. I think he's terrifying. Uh, he's definitely not like the best elite choice, but he's terrifying. He's a close combat monster. Toughness 8 with a 2 up save with 15 wounds, so he's already hard to kill. Upgrade him to give him the 4 up invuln from the adaptive physiologies, and then all of a sudden he's very scary. And essentially, um, in close combat, he's got five attacks that are strength 14 minus 3, D3 plus 3 damage. Or you can make those five attacks become 15 attacks, which are strength 7 minus 1, 2. So 15 auto cannon shots, all hitting on threes, by the way. And every time he kills a model, whether shooting or close combat, he regains a wound up to three per phase. So he basically eats. And he has a 6 inch aura of minus 2 leadership. He's got Horn Chitin as well for that trampling charge. He's got Acid Blood. If you want to hit him, you can trigger the fours to mortal wounds as you hurt him. And he has a Grasping Tongue, which he's always had, but it was kind of lame. That was pretty good. It's one shot still, 12 inch range, but it's strength six, minus three, three damage. And it ignores Lookout Sir. So that's like a, he could kill a Terminator with that quite easily. Just poof, hits on threes too. Weapon skill and ballistic skill start at three plus. That's pretty, that's pretty nice. Haro Specs, and I love the model, so that makes me like them even more. Venomthropes are clear winners as well. They've always been pretty good because they create an aura of minus one to hit. That aura is just is better than it used to be because it includes monsters no matter how many Venomthropes you have. So essentially they always have an aura, six inches. You shoot anything as long as it's not Titanic, you get minus one to hit them. You have that one strat as well, if they don't move, you pop that to 12 inches. That's a large part of the table. And then it has the grasping tendrils like the tox screen does, that if you try to fall back away from it, that it'll hold you there on a four plus. It's not as quite as good as a toxic screen, but it's still good. Um, and they do have this, and they do have the toxic lashes, just like the other ones. So they could actually use a strat to give you minus leadership and stuff too. Um, and they do have their own toxic miasma. So at the start of the fight phase, they do mortal wounds to nearby things. Not as much as a toxic screen, but um, uh, but yeah, it's but their oh actually their toxic screen makes their toxic miasma because you fight last. Hold on, does the toxic screen do that too? Did I miss that? Um, yeah, you're right. It's, I, did, I, I, I failed to notice that because the Toxic Green has never gotten to combat for me. He keeps dying. That So they both have a Toxic Miasma. It's hot, hyper toxic for the Toxic Green, which means it just does, it does more mortal wounds. Um, so basically the, 
The Toxicrine, at the start of the fight phase, you roll a die for each enemy unit with an engagement range on a 4+, plus. they take D3 mortal wounds, and they fight last. For the Venomthrope, you roll, you choose one enemy within 3 inches. 3 inches, not engagement range. Toxicrine is engagement range, the Venomthrope's 3 inches. On a 3+, plus, they take only one mortal wound, but they also fight last. So, boo, that's actually really good. So that's an addition. I, I, I haven't managed to get Venomthropes that far forward yet in the few games that I've played with them. And so I, I'm definitely going to be trying to use that tool. Zone Thropes, of course, are great. They lost their three up invul and it's four up now, but they gain a toughness and a wound. So essentially they're just as chunky as before. Um, and on top of that, their smite is the best smite in the entire game. So the way that works is when you cast smite um, or any other witchfire psychic power, you get plus one to the casting roll for every zone throw. So you bring a unit of three zone throws and you get plus three to cast. If you cast Smite and succeed, only Smite, not Witch Fires, you could add how many Zone Thropes there are, that's how many extra mortal wounds it does. So if you have three Zone Thropes, actually let's make it six. If you have six Zone Thropes, they'll get plus six to cast Smite, giving you a good chance of getting Super Smite and doing D6. And they'll do three extra mortal wounds because it caps out at three. So my favorite for Zone Thropes is to bring them in units of three. If you bring two units of three, you're trying pretty hard because then they both can smite. They're both getting plus three to cast and plus three mortal wounds. So on average, they're doing D3 plus three mortal wounds and they have a half decent chance of doing D6 plus three mortal wounds because they have a better chance of getting to that 11 or more. Throw the neural throw up in there, give one of them the roll 3D6 and take whatever two you want and boo, your opponent's going to be sweating and then be taking a lot of mortal wounds as well. Nobody smites as good as zone throw right now. Not even Grey Knights or Thousand Suns, which should have good smites, but they... They're okay smites. Zoanthropes, definitely a winner in the elite slot. Our last elite slot is Gene Stealers. You can't think of Gene Stealers anything like they used to be. They're no longer the shock troops. They can't advance and charge anymore, uh, which means that you can actually give them the extended carapace, which gives them minus one move, but plus one save. And that might actually make sense. Their close combat is nothing special. Four attacks that are strength four, minus three, one damage. Uh, you can give them, you can upgrade them with an infestation node, which will bring back some gene stealers in the command phase. But I found that they died too quick for that to matter. They can deploy anywhere on the table, more than nine inches away from the enemy deployment zone and enemy units, just like the Brood Lord. And like I said, this I think I got to rethink how gene stealers are meant to be used. I'll probably start bringing them in, like maybe a unit of five or maybe two units of five. And their job is not to get in there and fight. Their job is to run after objectives and perform actions. Other than that, to stay out of sight. Which is, which is too bad because Gene Stealers have always been the scary close combat thing. They used to be troop choice as well, and now they are elite choices. So that gets us to the end of the elite choices. And I'll be right back after this short break for you, very short. Let's move to fast attack choices now. In order, Raveners are first. Now it's interesting, in the last edition, Raveners were just like worse Tyranid warriors because uh, they would have a worse save than them and they didn't quite hit as hard of them and they didn't have as many options. Now, they feel almost a different role. <clears throat> Even though they have the same toughness as warriors, they're now a four up save just like warriors, and they actually have one more wound than a warrior, so they're a little tougher too. And uh, they're not synapse creatures though, so it's, it's almost like you wanna compare them to Tyranid warriors, but they're too different. Where they're similar is in how hard they hit. Like they're, these ones are five base attacks, and if you give them the Scything Talons and their, ra their Ravener Claws, then basically they'll have five attacks with the Ravener Claws, which are Strength 5, Minus 2. You can't give them Adrenal Glands, so they're Strength 5, Minus 2, unless you do Behemoth and they're Strength 6 on a charge. And then they'll have two more attacks with the Scything Talons at Strength 5, Minus 1. So that's seven attacks in total. And so whereas like the, the Tyranid Warriors can definitely hit harder and shoot too, now you can actually give Raveners Death Spitters for free, cost no points. So they all pop up and they fire, you know, if there's nine of them, they fire 27 shots, Strength 5, Minus 2. If you don't give them Death Spitters, they can reroll ones to hit, but the Death Spitters are free, so 100% of the time, you'll want to take Death Spitters unless you're playing down. You want to try to make them weaker, then that's what you would do. So where Raveners really succeed, that Warriors can't really function, is the two things. Well, it's mobility, really. It's the ability to deep strike anywhere on the table, and also the fact that they move 12 inches. And so they're, they're quite fast. They have the Burrowers keyword as well, which lets them use that one stratagem, which can disappear at the end of the turn, or at the end of the movement phase if you really want to. <clears throat> Although that's less useful than just the fact that they can pop up anywhere. They're minus one to hit as well in close combat because of their serpentine bodies. But I just find that they pop up, they shoot out their Death Spitters and do a ton of damage, they charge in, and then they're most likely killing whatever they charge because they have so many attacks, unless the thing is super resilient. And then if they do kill it, they can overrun and go somewhere else. They're, so they're just, they're really fast. 
So you have to kind of see them as just not like, like to me, they always used to be like, there's warriors and the raveners. It's now like, you just can't really compare them fully, even though you really want to. And they're core as well, so they can take all the buffs from all of the different HQs if they're on the table during the command phase. So I really like raveners. Like, if I was to pick between raveners and warriors, and I had to pick only one, warriors would win. But warriors are cheap choices, and these are fast attack, and so they, they're kind of supposed to fill different roles. We got Ripper Swarms. Ripper Swarms aren't great. Um, <clears throat> they, yeah, they're just not great, but they're cheap. And they, it's interesting, they turned them from troop choices to fast attack, which I'm fine. But then they said that they can't be used as compulsory fast attack slots. So the only one that really has compulsory fast attack slots would be your Brigade and your Outrider. So Outrider is where it's one to two HQs and then you can have three to six fast attack and you don't have to have troops. But you couldn't let the Ripper Swarms be the ones that are, that are minimum three. They just don't help for the compulsory slots. And if you're doing Brigade, which just lets you bring a lot of everything, you can't use them to fill out the fast attack. Now that might have been a bigger deal in last edition where you gained command points by bringing detachments. But in this edition, I'm not sure what the point of saying they don't take up a, like they don't take a compulsory slot is, because there's never a time when I care to. Either way, <clears throat> I don't really recommend purchasing Ripper Swarms. I feel like that the, the, it's in here so that when you spawn them using the Parasite, that you have the stats for them. So well, you could purchase them, but I'm not seeing a, a, I'm not seeing a role that they fill. That something else could just fill better. Now they are cheap though, so maybe that might help. The Parasite of Mortrex, of course, is our new favorite unit. Not favorite, but awesome fast attack. <clears throat> it's our new model. Excuse me. I just had lunch between those two breaks, and so now I have to clear my throat. It's not unique. The Parasite of Mortrex in older editions was unique. Never had a model though. Uh, so you could technically bring three of them using the rule of three. I'm not sure if you ever really want to. So we already talked about the Parasite before. So it has one attack card called the Barbed Ovipositor. Just one of the attacks. It has six attacks in total. <clears throat> uh, six with the, sorry, six with the clawed limbs, one with the Barbed Ovipositor. It's not really a close combat beast. It's got six attacks, strength five, minus two, one. And then another attack at strength six, minus one, one. That does a mortal wound in addition. But it's more that it infects whatever it attacks. And so if it hits with that one attack and then wounds, um, if, yeah, successfully wounds a unit, doesn't have, they can make their save and everything. They take a mortal wound and then they're infected. While they're infected, they lose objective secured. And um, every command, their command phase, they take D3 mortal wounds and there's a 50-50 chance they stop being infected essentially. And if you cause at least two mortal wounds with that D3 mortal wounds in their command phase, it spawns a Ripper Swarm, which is kind of cool. <coughs> now you can use the Stratagem, if you fly over a unit, to infect them as well on a 2+. plus, So that, I think that's better. So the real use for the Parasite for me, besides that he's, first off, he's a Synapse creature, and he has his own Synaptic Imperative, which is an extra pylon and consolidated 3 inches, which actually is pretty good. Especially later game when you're trying to get that extra movement to get places and hold objectives. Um, so he, gets, he keeps the Synaptic Link going on, but he's also a character, which means you can give him Relics and Warlord traits. I really like giving him Alien Cunning. So his objective secured, counts as five models, and can perform um, actions even if he advances or falls back. You combine that with a gestation sack on him, which is the relic that spawns Ripper Swarms as an action in the shooting phase. So he can advance forward, he can infect something, then spawn those Ripper Swarms, and then spawn Ripper Swarms from, from the, the, <coughs> the infected whatever it is as well. That to me is what he's all about. Jumping around, providing synapse, keeping up with faster things, and... Um, and then infecting things. Taking an objective secured away from models is a big deal, especially because if you make him alien cunning, he has objective secured. So you plop him on, fly over a unit that's on an objective, land next to it, on a two plus, they lose objective secured, that's your objective now, even if all you do is stand there. Molochs and Trigons got moved to fast attack from heavy support. So the Moloch has totally changed how it works. Now, <clears throat> it's weird, uh, I'm not, he's, he's cool, he's not necessarily awesome, um, I don't know if I'd call him better than what he used to be. He's maybe he's got 16 attacks, but they're strength seven minus one, one damage. So cool. <laughs> it's a lot of kind of attacks. Like they're only one damage each. So he's a, he's a horde attacker. He burrows and uh, basically what you do is in your command phase when he's underground, you can pick one of your Molochs underground. So you don't really want more than one or two of them. You pick a point on the table and you say that's where he's coming and your opponent basically has their turn to get out of the way because once it's your um when does it happen i think it's in your reinforcements yeah in your reinforcement step you roll d6 for every enemy unit within six inches of the marker 
and on a 3 plus they take d3 mortal wounds, on a 7 plus they take d3 plus 3 mortal wounds. You add 1 to it if there's 6 to 10 models and 2 to it if there's 11 or more. So it's kind of like it'll deal a bunch of mortal wounds, not a ton, but then you can place your Moloch anywhere within 12 inches of that center. So you have, this, you have the point, everything within 6 inches will take mortal wounds, and then you can place it anywhere within 12 inches. So that's a pretty wide, not wholly within by the way, it's within. So it's a pretty wide circle, so zoning it out is next to impossible. If you manage to place it more than 9 inches from enemies, then you can still charge. But you can actually place it any outside of engagement range of enemies, so you can just drop onto an objective. If you've combined this with the one um, biomorphology that makes all of your monsters objective secured, and if they have 10 or more wounds, which the Moloch does, it counts as five models, you can, the Moloch becomes a very powerful objective grabber. But once again, you have to kind of show your opponent where it's going to be coming in roughly in your command phase. So having one of these is kind of neat for that reason. And then you can also fight. It's a toughness seven, 14 wounds, three up saves, so it takes a bit of firepower to take it down as well, which is kind of cool. Uh, you got the Trigon, which is just basically the baby version of the Trigon Prime. Same size, same model, it just doesn't have Synapse. It's essentially everything the Trigon Prime is, just with a little less of everything. Um, so, and that's about it. There's really nothing else to talk about with him. He's exactly the same, except he's not a Synapse creature and he's not an HQ choice. Uh, why you would choose a Trigon over a Trigon Prime, I'm not quite sure, except maybe you have a few less points. And so that's about it. I'd rather take the Trigon Prime, to be honest. Then you got your spores. You got your mucolid spores and you got your spore mines. Now these no longer have, um, they don't, they're not part of your hive fleet, but they don't prevent you from having a hive fleet. So they gain none of the benefits from your hive fleet. So if they're hive fleet Hydra, for example, they don't get plus one to their move. Now they work very different than the way they used to. It used to be at the end of the charge phase, anybody's charge phase, if you were within three inches of spores, they blew up and possibly did mortal wounds to you. They were also, the regular spore mines were like toughness one with a seven up save and none of the keywords that let you actually get cover bonuses. So they were super easy to kill. You just sniffed at them with any weapon and you were winning on twos. Well, a couple things have changed. Basically now with mucolid spores and spore mines, that they explode as soon as you come within three inches of them. Now, and enemies can ignore them for everything. They can deep strike close to them. They can move through them as long as they end up um, far enough away on the other side. They can essentially, they, you can't use them to zone things out. Um, but they're super scary because if an enemy comes within three inches, and that includes you moving them, so they move four inches and you can advance them. They can't charge, they don't do morale, they don't do actions, they can't be used for victory points in any way. In other words, your opponent doesn't get points for killing them if they have uh, an objective to kill models. Um, they're ignored for lookout, sir, all that kind of stuff. But as soon as they're within three inches of an enemy, they can you can choose to blow them up. On a two plus, you take, depending on which one it is, if it's a spore mine, two plus does one mortal wound, and a five plus does D3 mortal wounds. The mucolid on a two plus does D6 mortal wounds, and on a five plus does D3 plus three mortal wounds. Furthermore, if you purchase them, which I actually did in one of my games and I loved it, you can put them in reserve and they can float in on the first turn, nine inches away from the opponent. Um, the first, second, or third movement phase, regardless of any mission rules, it says. And so I actually had one game where I bought two units of nine of them. That's 90 points each, because they're 10 points a model. And in the first turn, they floated down in front. I, I basically ran up a bunch of things, and he's looking at me being like, I can just shoot those. And I'm like, yeah, sure. And then I dropped down 18 spore mines in front of him. And then I had Biovore's seeds a few more spore mines, and we'll get to that. And all of a sudden, he's like, crap, I have two choices here. I shoot the spore mines which are now, by the way, toughness three with a six up save and they're beasts, so they can actually benefit from cover, although they didn't really have that, but still, toughness three means you all of a sudden actually, you actually have to put something onto them and you're not, only, you're not gonna necessarily win them on twos anymore. And a six up save means unless there's some AP, I might save a couple of them. So you don't wanna overkill them because you don't get anything for killing them. But if he doesn't shoot them, they on average do more than one mortal wound each. If you do the math, so you have six facings to the die, on a one, it doesn't do anything. Uh, two does one, three does one, four does one, five does D3, six does D3. If we average D3 to be two, that'll be two, two. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Divide that by six, they do a bit more than one mortal wound. Uh, so those nine floating in would do on average maybe 10 or 11 mortal wounds if you don't deal with them. Sure, it's one use, you don't get them again, but if you have biovores, you can build more of them. But even if you don't, that's a turn of them having to worry about that rather than come after your guys. And so I actually really like spore mines. I haven't really used the mucolid. I'm like, I'd rather have the bodies 
The mucolids are toughness four with four wounds, so they're technically, um, they're obviously harder to kill, but they also cost roughly the same as a few spore mines. So they, they're both good. I just, I'm not sure why I would care about the mucolids more than the spore mines. Uh, sure, the Duna two plus does D6 mortal wounds. That could be it, but a D6 could easily just draw down to a one or a two. I'd rather, I'd rather have three or four things. Well, actually, if I look at their current points, let's see the difference here. So we've got spore mines at 10 points a model and mucolid at 20. So two spore mines or one mucolid. See, now, that's, now that I realize it's only 20 points, only twice as many points, I can see that being a good choice as well. Because two spore mines on average will do a bit more than two mortal wounds. One mucolid on average will do easily three or four mortal wounds. Two spore mines are two wounds, toughness three. One mucolid is four wounds, toughness four. So, uh, okay, yeah, never mind. Mucolids are awesome. I just haven't played, that was, like I said, that was the one thing I haven't played with yet. Now that I've analyzed and looked at them, I'm totally going to try them out in maybe one of my next games because they look really cool. So spores are really neat. I, I, I like how they changed it. It feels more thematic, like you're walking into this minefield. And by the way, if you, you can move through them, but as long as any part of your move comes within three inches, they can explode. We've got the Exocrine, which was a scary monster before. It still is, a little different now. It used to be six shots, and if you stood still, it could fire twice. Now it got rid of the whole standing still and firing twice, which I'm really glad, because I don't like to be encouraged to not move. And instead, um, if it stands still, it can basically ignore cover. Remember I was saying before that it had a stratagem where it can ignore cover and do extra hits? Well, it does have part of that in here if it stands still. But once again, that's encouraging to stand still. Like I said, if it was like moving half or less, it should also get the other one too. So, you know, I guess it does have this here right, right now. I've used the Exocrine, I think, once or twice. Uh, it, was, it was fine. He's got D3 plus 6 shots with the Blast ability, which means if there's 11 or more, it'll do its max. Otherwise, it doesn't matter because it's already 6 plus D3. So it's 7 to 9 shots that are Strength 8 minus 4, 3 damage. That's good. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't think I'd ever really pop the strat to get the extra hits on 6s unless I, they were also in cover, in which case I could ignore like dense cover or light cover or something like that. Um, but yeah, so Exocrine is a good gunboat. Oh, sorry, we're in heavy support now. I should point that out. We're in the heavy support options. Exocrine is cool as a gun beast. Biovores, at first when I read them, they seem kind of lame. Uh, it used to be Biovores would fire, and if they missed, you'd place spore mines, and if they hit, they do mortal wounds. Essentially, they were firing spore mines at you. Now, if you shoot, if you hit, you do a mortal wound, a singular, and if you miss, nothing happens. And instead, you have to do an action. In other words, you choose not to shoot to place spore mines. So right now, each of them, they only hit on fours, by the way. They're not core, so they can't be buffed in any way. And they have D3 shots each um, that if you hit, it just does a mortal wound. Um, they can fire out a line of sight as long as the synapse can see them, but then you'll have the hole and now you're only hitting on fives because of the, the rule for that, so I wouldn't ever do that. Where I think biovores are really useful is in their seed spore mines action. So that is at the start of your shooting phase. You basically do it instead of shooting, but it, but it happens at the end of your shooting phase. So you can see the rest of all your shooting before you do this. Uh, essentially, you, you spawn a new unit of spore mines and the number of spore mines is D3 per biovore. Now, since it's an action that only one biovore unit can do, so at first I thought I'd want to bring three biovores and have each of them do it, but then when I read it, it said only one can do it. So I would actually recommend, if you're going to do biovores, you bring a unit of three of them. They're only, well, I shouldn't talk about points right now because I know they'll change. They're, they're not super expensive. And so, and you can just keep them out of line of sight because they don't need line of sight for this one. And they can place a unit of three D3 spore mines uh, regular ones, not the mucolids, anywhere within four feet, 48 inches, and more than six inches from enemies, not nine. Now, they can't charge or anything like that, so they're not going to explode, but you can really use them to zone out areas, not from deep striking, but just like, hey, you got to deal with these guys now. And if you keep your biovores out of line of sight, so if you have three of them spawning D3 each, that's on average six, then at 60 points with the current points costs. Um, according to their current points cost, you make that that in, in, in three turns you've made more than their points in spore mines, plus you get to choose where they go every turn. So I actually think biovores could be something quite good. Um, they, I used to think of them in like the, the, some of the worst models, but after, because I played them the first time where I just tried to shoot stuff, but then I played them again just seeding spores, and I'm like, no, these are actually kind of good. Now we'll come to my favorite part of the entire book, which is Carnifexes. There are three types of Carnifexes. Carnifexes, Screamer Killers, and Thornbacks. So the Carnifex is the most versatile. It's the one that you can basically give whatever upgrades you want. You can, there's the head morph, so you can give them Blissed Skill 3+, plus, 
tusks so they can have the horn chitin and do more mortal wounds and a trampling charge. You can give them plasma so they spit. You can give them, uh, oh, there's one more I always forget about, acid moss, so they have the acid moss keyword. And then you can kit up their arms however you want. You can give them shooting, you can give them close combat, um, you can give them adrenal glands and toxin sacs, you can give them chitin thorns, give an extra AP in close combat. Um, you can give them spore cysts on the back so that they count as being on light cover all the time. And by the way, their toughness seven, nine wounds, two up save, and minus one damage. They are tough as nails, even for whatever points they have or whatever points they go up to. And their core, which I've played all those games and now just realized. So here's Matthew, the expert Tyranid player. I'm just realizing now their core. I'm like, wow, that makes me even better than I thought. And so the big question is, Carnifexes, Screamer Killers, or Thornbacks. So Carnifex can have all those upgrades. So here's the difference. Screamer Killers, same stats, except that they move 10 instead of, si of 8. Really, it's going to be 11 instead of 9 because you give them adrenal glands. Uh, the big difference, though, is they're only close combat, except for their, their bioplasmic screen, which is just a few shots. A D6, strength 8, minus 4 shots. The hit on 4s. It's, it's okay, but it's nothing special. The uh, difference, though, is Screamer Killers have 10 attacks. Whereas if you kit out a Carnifex with the same weapons, they'd only have eight. So they have two more attacks, same weapon as the, they have the Screamer Killer Talons, which I believe is the same as a Carnifex Scything Talon. Yeah, it's minus, it's strength user, minus three, three. So Screamer Killer Talons, that same thing. Um, the other thing that they have though, is that they're terrifying. And so every model they kill in the unit, they get minus one leadership for that morale um, until the end of the turn, up to a maximum minus four. And so the Screamer Killer is clearly the winner when it comes to close combat. But like the Tyranid Warriors, where you can give them all close combat, or you can give them part shooting, part close combat, the Carnifex, I find that my favorite loadout with a Carnifex is a heavy Venom Cannon on the bottom, and then two uh, Carnifex Scything Talons. And so what this effectively does, the heavy Venom Cannon is already really good, Carnifex is only hit on, uh, sorry, and, and then Enhanced Senses, so they have a Blissed Skill 3+. And then if you have old one eye, you can make it twos, but, or, and you got, and since they're core, you could give them some help with that kind of stuff too, with the Hive Tyrants or whatever. But they're hitting on threes. Heavy Venom Cannon, of course, is um, strength nine minus three, four damage. Three shots. So each Carnifex, and they're relatively cheap. You give them that, you give them the Spore Assist, so they always kind of be in light cover, so they effectively walking around with a one plus save against shooting, except for somebody who ignores cover, but still, it's, you know, with a minus one damage, not, uh, seven toughness, nine wounds, they're hard to move. Firing those three shots. Sure, once they get into close combat, they'll only have six attacks, opposed to the Screamer Killer's ten. But you're losing four attacks for being able to fire every turn. So when I do my uh, lots of Carnifex, I like to do a mix. I'll, uh, for basically for every Screamer Killer I bring, I'd want to bring a Carnifex with a Heavy Venom Cannon and Scything Talons, if I'm trying. If I don't care, then it's just lots of Screamer Killers because it's lots of fun. One thing I cannot figure out though, and maybe you can help me with this in the comments, is what is the purpose of a Thornback? So this is the third type of Carnifex. The third type of Carnifex, uh, same stats, except they only move six. So you have six, eight, and 10. Those are your diff three different movement. They do have, they ignore light cover, not all cover, just light cover, and six is to wound to an extra AP. All right, so the ignoring light cover, eh, okay, all right, whatever. And they come built in with chitin thorns to get an extra AP in close combat. But here's the rub. Um, if you want to give them a decent close combat or a decent shooting weapon, you've got to give up their close combat. So they, whereas the Screamer Killer has to have a Latalons, the Thornback has to have a set of regular guns. So this is your Devourers, your Despitters. So either 12 strength 6 AP nothing shots or 6 strength 7 minus 3 shots, all damage 1. Uh, by the way, their Blissed Skill is a 4+. plus. You can give them Enhanced Senses to make it a 3+, plus, though, so let's assume you do that. But if you want the other one to be a better gun, first off, it can't be a Heavy Venom Cannon. It has to be a Stranglethorn Cannon, which is your D3 plus 3 Blast Shot, Strength 8 minus 2, 2, which is fine, but I think it's only really good when it becomes a Relic one. And it will ignore Light Cover. So if you want the Close Combat, but if you want the Close Combat, then you don't really care about the Ignoring Light Cover and 6s do extra AP, and you might as well play... Heck, a regular Carnifex would do a better job at it. Um, but I just, I just don't see it. I'm not, and you can't even give them spore cysts to give them that always in light cover thing. So I do not see a purpose for which the thorn back fills. If it could have a heavy venom cannon and scything talons, so it's like a regular Carnifex but ignores cover and has to, even if it has to bring chitin thorns instead of the spore cysts, so the chitin thorns give an extra AP in close combat, the spore cysts count in light cover. 
then maybe I could see that, but I'm not seeing it. I, I, I don't see it at all. Like, and they move slowly too, they move six inches. If they were more survivable because they're like more lumbering, maybe like they're, you're your typical old school Carnifex, which is just supposed to be like so hard to move. Um, but, but no, there's nothing that makes them more survivable. Uh, in fact, they're less survivable because you can't give them spore cysts. So they don't get that extra save. So I just, I'm failing to see what the purpose of a thornback is, that a Carnifex cannot do better um, and that a Screamer Killer just is totally different from. So for me, it's Carnifexes and Screamer Killers. The nice thing, even with the rule of three, that still lets you bring 18 Carnifex bodies because three units of three Carnifexes, that stays within the rule of three, that's nine Carnifexes. Three units of three Screamer Killers, that's another nine Screamer Killers. That's 18 Carnifexes. That's way more than 2,000 points. So you, you'll never need that many. So you don't even need the Thornbacks to be like, well, they fill the role of rule of three makes it so you can't have that many card effects. It's like, well, no, they don't. I don't, I don't need them for that at all. So yeah, in the comments below, if you have an answer to the problem as to what they fit, except maybe to play down, let me know. I'd love to hear. Hive Guard, of course they got a massive nerf from the last edition. I'm glad they did because everybody was bringing them. They're not totally useless, but they're definitely lower tier now than they used to be. Uh, their Impaler Cannon that could fire out of, out of line of sight and do tons of damage. It now does a lower strength. It does a flat 2 instead of D3, but with the new changes, or not new, the, the somewhat recent changes that if you fire out of line of sight, you get your Blissed Skill worsened by 1 and they get plus 1 save. You don't want to fire them out of line of sight. Their Shock Cannon is about the same as what it used to be. It's good against vehicles, but like, who cares? It always wounds vehicles on a 4+, plus and does a mortal wound if it rolls a 4+. plus. Uh, it can do a defensive action, which I can't figure out. That in the command phase, you basically, um, uh, it counts as three models for holding the objectives, but it's not objective secured, nor can it be made so because it's not core. So I don't know what that's for. Um, now, it, it can fire out a line sight and not take any modifiers because it does have a synaptic guidance. As long as a synapse creature can see the target, then it, it can ignore any or all hit roll and ballistic skill modifiers. So it can ignore that new thing, but they'll still get plus one of their save. I'm just not seeing it. It's three shot, strength six, minus two, two where it used to be strength 8 minus 2 D3. Arguably 2 is better than D3, although in the meta D3 could be arguably better than 2 because if you're up against minus 1 damage stuff, D3 has a chance to do 2, 2 never does. I, I, it's, it, they're fine. They're, they're just obviously, they've been nerfed and that's okay. The Tyrant effects is interesting as well because he fills roles that others can do better, but he's just such a big beat stick with it and I like it because he's a toughness 8, 17 wound, 2 up save car or, uh, monster with horned chitin, so you can do the trampling charge. He's only got 4 close combat attacks. They're, they're basically auto cannons. They're strength 7, minus 1, 2, 2 damage. But it used to be that if a Trine effects didn't move, it could fire twice. They got rid of that and they just upped all of his number of attacks by like 50%. So if you bring the Flesh Borer Hive, it's 30 strength 5, minus 1 shots. If you bring the Acid Spray, it's an 18 inch auto hit D6 plus 6 shot, strength 6, minus 3, 2 damage. I think that's probably your best one. And then the Rupture Cannon is 3 shots, strength 14, minus 4, D6 plus 4 damage. That sounds awesome, but you only got 3 shots and you're only hitting on 3s. So, you know, command points can help you there. But he's not core, so you can't really buff him to do anything special with that. I think the winner with the Tran effects will be the Acid Spray. The other ones have a purpose, like the Flesh Bore Hive. Is, I actually played him once that way. It is pretty scary. Because he also has Stinger Salvos, which is another 8 strength, eight, 5 minus 1 shot. So basically, he fires 38 strength 5 minus 1 shots hit on 3s. If you're getting close combat with him, yeah, he's not going to hurt you. But he can fire all 38 of those shots without any penalties because they're all assault weapons. So I kind of find him as more like a mobile fortress. So while, yes, there are other things that could probably do his job better, he does his job just fine. So I like him, like I said, I, I like him with all three weapon options. But the Rupture Cannon, to me, is kind of the worst one because it's just like you're... You're banking on a very small number of shots doing a whole lot of damage. And that's something I'm never comfortable with. Um, we then have our dedicated transport, the Tyrannocyte. So it's basically like drop pod rules now, except it's, it's, it's survivable. It's toughness 7, 15 wounds, 4 up save. But it can come in turn 1. So you can load it up with 20 models or one monster with a wounds characteristic of 16 or less, which means... No Tyrannifex? Yeah, so no Tyrannifex is inside of your Tyrannocytes. But you can put a Tyrannocyte inside of your Tyrannocyte, and then have a Tyrannocyte inside of that Tyrannocyte. It doesn't give you any bonuses, I don't know why you do that. They did FAQ it so that the Tyrannocyte comes in, it has to be more than 9 inches away, and then it immediately forces you to disembark, like a drop pod. And so these are cool because then they continue, unlike a drop pod, they're not immobile, they move 8 inches. They're actually fast. They have fly, 
And so they can get around and they have a decent amount of weapons. You can give them their basic five death spitters, so they'll have 15 strength five minus two shots. You can give them venom cannons for strength eight minus three two, or barb stranglers if you want. They're only blissed skill five plus, so they're just like moderate firepower. But when one game I upgraded a tyrannocyte because it's a monster to be a synapse creature. So it came down, shot, and then I did the shard lure uh, uh, synap or stratagem so that then everything that just came out would be able to roll three dice and pick their best two for charges. So it was a nice little combo and enhanced and it created synapse. So you bring it in with like 20 hormigons. Normally the hormigons are far away from synapse now, but they can move forward and that tyrannocyte could be a synapse creature, which is kind of cool. So there's a lot of cool uses for entranocytes, and the fact that it lets you, um, and, and it doesn't count towards any limits of what goes in reinforcement. So your whole army could be inside of tyrannocytes off the table first turn and show up first turn, just like drop pods. So I love that they changed the rules to make them just like drop pods. Let's go to our flyers. We've got two flyers, Hive Crones and Harpies. Hive Crones, if I had to pick one unit in the entire codex that was the absolute bottom thing, it would be a Hive Crone. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with the Hive Crone. The Harpy, I can talk about all day. The Hive Crone, he's got, like I can read his abilities and be like, yeah, that doesn't sound so bad. It's more like, yeah, sure, but why? Why would I bring him? So he's a flyer, um, moves 15 to 40 inches. Um, it can actually turn twice. The Harpy can do that as well. So it follows all the flyer rules. It's hard to hit, blah, blah, blah. It can hover if it wants to. By default, because of the Drool Cannon, which is basically a long range flamer, 2d6 shot, strength six minus two, one. Cool, it'll kill some Griblies. It also has Stinger Salvos. It has Tentaclids, which are really good against vehicles and aircraft. Uh, basically, they go to damage four if it's against an aircraft and vehicles that always wins on fours, just like the Hive, uh, hive Guards one weapon. Um, but it's like, but so what? If, uh, like, there's a limit on aircraft now is, is in a Strike Force game is two. And so I have to, if the only, so the only thing Hive Prone I would say is definitely okay at is going against um, other aircraft. And even then, it, I just, I'm not seeing it. So I'm, I'm just not seeing it. It, it, it gets plus one to hit against things that have fly. So that helps with the minus one if you're firing against an aircraft. But um, I don't know, I'm not seeing it. And in close combat, it's nothing really special. It's got four attacks, strength six, minus two, two. Um, and then one additional, just one attack. at strength nine, minus four, three. It's all fine. I'm just looking through its rules again. I'm like, did I miss anything? I'm just not seeing it. It's got horn chitin, so it can trampoline charge. Like it has all the, the tools that other things have. But um, it, it's just, to me, it's the worst thing in the entire codex. And that's like below the hive guard and the ripper swarms. Now, like obviously it's stronger than ripper swarms. I'm saying worse points for points. Come to the harpy on the other hand, and this is a very powerful flyer, very, very powerful aircraft, because it's walking around with either two heavy venom cannons or two stranglethorn cannons, most likely two heavy venom cannons. So going around, hitting on threes, six shots, strength nine minus three, four. Nothing else can bring two heavy venom cannons, by the way. If you're reading your codex without the FAQ, it might appear that you can bring two heavy venom cannons on a hive tyrant, but you can't. They FAQ'd that. On top of the harpy, every time it moves, it can drop spores. So you can either drop spores onto, um, onto units and do mortal wounds to them, or it can just drop a unit of three spores on the table, which then move around and does everything that we talked about with spores, which is pretty awesome. And so, yeah, so it's flying around with two heavy venom cannons, and you can upgrade it because it's a monster. You can give it a four-up invuln, or you can make it a synapse creature so it benefits from whatever synaptic imperative is going on. And also can extend the synaptic link ability, but it's just, so yeah, it's, it's a pretty straightforward thing to talk about. It flies around and guns the heck out of stuff with its two heavy venom cannons and drops spores. That's a winner in my, in my opinion. So obviously the flyer section is pretty easy to select a, a winner because there's only two of them, and that would be the harpy. But honestly, if the Harpy and Hive Crone were amongst everything else, and I said I had to pick a winner or a loser, the Hive Crone would definitely be at the bottom of that. And then that brings us to our last thing, a fortification, which is actually useful, is a Sporocyst. Now, I've always loved the Sporocyst, it's that tick that comes in. It has a Vanguard deployment, so basically it sets up anywhere on the table more than 12 inches away from the enemy deployment zone. You don't want to get too hasty with them. They do, it's the fun thing about them is they gain the Synapse ability as long as they're within 12 inches of another Synapse. So they basically relay synapse along it. So they're really good for that. Um, that's really cool. But they also have, like the biovores, they have the seed spores action, um, which they can do in addition to a biovore unit, but only one sporocyst can do it. So if you have three sporocysts, you can only have one of them do the action. And that sets up a new unit of six spore mines 
or one mucolid spore. So this would always be the six spore mines because we already said that one mucolid spore is better than two spore mines, but it's definitely not better than six. Um, I think that's pretty easy. Anywhere within 18 inches of the sporocyst and more than six from enemies. And by the way, all these things that I said, the turvagons spawning termagants, the biovores and the sporocysts and the harpies spawning um, spore mines, the parasitomortrex spawning ripper swarms, none of these cost reinforcement points. These are free. You don't have to have points set aside in order to do all of these abilities, which is pretty good. Sporocyst has the same basic stats when it comes to gun-wise as a tyrannocyte. It has less wounds. It only has 10 wounds. But it still hits on fives, and it can have five death spitters, or five venom cannons, or five barb stranglers. So and it's cool because it's actually a useful fortification. It doesn't cost you any command points to bring because it's a tyranid fortification. So you could bring that extra detachment of one to three of these. I'd probably try maybe one of them, maybe two, just because only one of them, one sparsis model, can start to perform this action. Um, and it's in the movement phase it does the action, so it's not like it has to give up shooting to spawn spore mines. And that was always the case before. It always spawned spore mines and fired its weapons as well, which is pretty cool. Um, in fact, the weapon that fired could spawn spore mines too, which was also neat. It doesn't have that anymore, which is okay. And then we get to the weapon profiles, which I don't think I need to go through. The points values, which will always change. Our glossary, our reference, and our shiny little picture at the back of the book, and, and my code, which I'm not going to show you. I think I already used it anyways to load it up. And that is Matthew's almost complete and utter guide to the War, Warhammer 40k 9th edition Codex Tyranid book, except not the Crusade rules or the three GT things. And I guess I didn't play the Mucolid Spores, and I missed that one stratagem, but I did tell you about it now, so at least I got it right after playing a bunch of games of Tyranids. That'll be the title of this video. How about that? How does that sound? So, I hope you enjoyed that. That was quite the long, um, rambling video. And so if you were painting stuff, let me know what you were doing during watching this video. Leave a comment. If you made it this far, I'd love to leave a comment below saying, I made it to the end, and this is what I was doing while watching your video. Because I'm actually curious. These longer videos obviously have a different type of audience than a short 10 to 15 minute typical YouTuber video, or even a battle report. So leave a comment below, and if you want future videos like this where we like do a complete something after we played a bunch of games with it, and you want it like in this format or you want the format different, you let me know. Leave all those in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching, and happy wargaming. We play and call it work.